looks at this person standing right there, and she says, knowing not it was Jesus, or he says, he speaks to her next in verse 15, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, thinking him to be the gardener, <clears throat> said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, if you have taken him away, tell me where he is, where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And then verse 16, Jesus said, Mary, can't you just hear it? Oh, that voice of endearment. They had known each other so closely for three years. And she recognizes that voice. And now look what she attempts to do. Very human. She was just going to give him a bear hug. And what does Jesus say? He says unto her, touch me not. Now, you remember just a few hours later, he tells old Doubting Thomas to touch the wounds in his hands and in his side, so there wasn't anything that contrary. But here, he tells Mary, touch me not. Now, what's the reason? For I am not yet ascended to my Father. You see what it said? I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to the brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, to your Father, to my God, and your God. I call this the first ascension in Acts chapter 1, the second ascension. Now, if you'll come back with me to Hebrews, I think we can explain it. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9. Now, in this chapter, Paul is rehearsing the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement, first with the blood of an animal and sprinkle it back behind the curtain on the Holy of Holies or on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, for his own sin. He'd go back and he would take the blood of the second animal, take it in behind the veil, sprinkle it on the mercy seat there in the Holy of Holies, that taking care of the sins of the nation. Now then, you drop down to verse 11. But Christ being come a high priest. Now, we have to have a high priest. Aaron was the high priest of Israel. Melchizedek, you remember, was the high priest of all as a picture of Christ, our high priest. All right, but high, the high priest Christ went by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. In other words, where is it? In heaven. And so into that holy of holies in heaven neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once, not just once a year, but once for all time, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. What did he present in the Holy of Holies in heaven? His own blood. Thank you for watching. Now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to have everybody back, and once again, we'll just pick up where we left off and go back with me to Exodus chapter 6, and again, we want to invite all those of you watching us on television to get your Bible and compare all these scriptures with us as we hopefully compare scripture with scripture, because that's the only way we can make any sense out of all this. And all, only reason I teach, you know, I tell people all the time, uh, I only teach for one purpose, <clears throat> and that is to help people to understand what they read. And I think we're, we're making some headway. Uh, I had a young man again tell me the other night, he said, my, he said, how thankful I am that you finally came on the scene, because I never understood what I read. Well, hopefully, this is what we can accomplish, is helping you to understand what the book really says. <clears throat> all right, now in Exodus chapter 6, we left off at verse 6 where God speaks of redeeming the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's going to buy them back. He's going to pay the price as he has even done in our own redemption, you and I as believers in this age of grace. Then I'd like to have you drop down to, well, might as well take verse 7 and 8. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who bringeth you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. Now verse 8, those of you who have been with me now all the time, remember that Abrahamic covenant. He's going to make out of Abraham a nation of people. He's going to give them a geographical area of land. And then one day he's going to come and be their king. Now that was all in that Abrahamic covenant. And so here it is again. <clears throat> I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham Abraham 
to Isaac and to Jacob. Now, those three names, you know, pop up all the way through your Bible, well into the New Testament, well into the book of Acts. And everything is based upon that promise that God gave to those three gentlemen. And he says, I will give it to you, that is the land, for a heritage. And the reason he can do it, he's the Lord, he's the creator, he's the sovereign God. And so Moses spake such unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for the cruel bondage. Now let's drop down to verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron. Oh, i got to stop here and correct a mistake I made in the last program. It wasn't her and Caleb. It was Aaron and her. I'll do that for sake of someone on television is going to be writing and telling me that I was wrong. And I, uh, I want to correct it before we go any further. All right, so now then we come down... Verse 13, And so the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Everything is getting ready now. And now we're not going to go through those next series of verses, giving all the names of the various tribes and the heads of them and so forth. But I do want you to see something in verse 26. These are, in other words, all these families are that Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their, what? Armies. Now, not armies as we understand. They had no weapons. As I pointed out here some time ago, two or three programs ago, they were just like that locust I gave you an example of that was wrapped in that spider's web. They had no way of doing anything. They had no arms. They had no swords or spears or shields. They had no way whatsoever of overthrowing their Egyptian slave masters. They had to wait completely for the power of God to come in on their behalf. But I think we have to understand that even as you've looked back into the Holocaust and, and other aspects of Jewish history, they had a resiliency. And I think a lot of it was based on their tribal organization. And I think even here in Egypt, they had an organization so that they didn't have loudspeakers, they didn't have radio, they didn't have uh, phones in their cars and what have you. And yet, how did Moses communicate with those several million Jews? Through an organization. And he would just simply bring the heads of the tribes together and they would go out and just like a military command, it went down through the chain of command. And so never, never see Israel as coming out of Egypt in, in just a mob. Uh, they were organized. And again, when they get the tabernacle set up, as we'll be coming to it in future chapters, God organized in such a way that every time they set up camp, the same three tribes were on the east, the same three on the north, the same on the west, and so on and so forth. And when they moved out, they always moved out in the same order. They were a nation of orderly people. And I want you to remember that. Now verse 27. These are they which spake to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. And these are that Moses and Aaron. Well, now we're going to come and confront Pharaoh. And I'd like to have you, for sake of time now, come on over to verse 10. Verse 10 of chapter 7, where Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Now we're going to use the signs again, only now why are they using it? They're going to convince Pharaoh that God is the God of Israel. But now we got something interesting happen, and I think we're living in a time that we better see what the Scripture says. What has happened? Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, and now the magicians of Egypt, the sorcerers, those who practiced the occult, they drew their power from the powers of Satan. They come, and they also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. You see that? They had the satanic power to copy what Moses had just, or Aaron had just done with the power of God. But don't stop there. 
They became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Now, God is the creator of life. He is the sustainer of life. He is the very God of life. But Satan is not the sustainer of life. Satan is the sustainer of and the giver of what? Death. Sin came by death or death came by sin and the two are almost synonymous in the human experience. Death is on the scene every day because of sin. Sin and death are synonymous. Now then, let's see what happens uh, in that same connotation in our New Testament. Turn with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now don't forget what we just read, that as Aaron placed his rod on the ground and became a serpent, the Egyptian magicians threw their down, they became serpents, but Aaron's serpent swallowed up the Egyptian serpents. Now what's the picture? New Testament will tell us. 1 Corinthians chapter... 15, oh my, we got to start with these exciting verses of 51 on. Verse 51, and we think we're getting closer to the day all the time. As you see, the world falling apart, governments on shaky ground, turmoil all around the planet. I got a kick out of some of the world's seismologists again the other day explaining the increase in earthquakes all over the planet. And they know there's a tremendous increase, but of course they don't know why. We do. The Bible tells us that there's going to be an increase in the number of earthquakes. And so everything is, is coming on. It's just piling up for the soon return of Christ. As Paul describes it here now in verse 51, behold, he says, I show you a mystery. He reveals a secret. Now, you want to remember that nowhere in Scripture has it ever been told that there would be a group of people living, and of course, Enoch was a good example of it, but the Scripture gives no indication of a group of living people who will suddenly be gone and translated until Paul. And that's why he calls it a secret or a mystery. He said, Behold, I show you a secret. Jesus never mentioned this. The Old Testament never mentioned it, but Paul does. And so he calls it a secret. We shall not all sleep or die physically, but we shall all be changed. Now, the reason has to be, of course, we can't go to glory in this old body. Now, those who are dying and will experience resurrection, we can understand they'll have a new body, but what about us who are alive? Well, it has to be changed, and that's what he's teaching here. Now, I didn't intend to make this a point of lesson because I want to come to that which is later, but we can't pass over this lightly. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling or the blink of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And Paul says, we believers shall be changed suddenly. Why? Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal, this body that is prone to die, must put on immortality. We have to be made fit for eternity in God's presence. We have to be given this new body. All right, now then, here's where I really wanted to come to point out what took place back there with Aaron's rod and his serpent and the other magicians' rods and their serpents, remembering that Aaron's serpent swallowed up those Satans that were uh, those serpents that were representative of Satan and his death. Now, verse 54. So when this corruptible, this body that we have that is prone to corruption, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, now look at it, death is what? Swallowed up in victory. Now do you see how it all ties together? As those serpents of the magicians of Egypt were writhing on the ground and Aaron's serpents swallowed them, 
it was the picture that this is exactly how God is finally going to control the situation and death is swallowed up in victory. Now, where was the victory over death accomplished? At the cross, see? At the cross. That's where Satan was defeated. And since Christ has now been put to death, has been buried in the grave three days and three nights, and he rose from the dead, that's the power that separates us then from the power of sin and death and Satan and what have you. Well, we could just go on and spend some more time on that, but we want to make a little more headway in Exodus before we quit. So I'd like to have you come all the way over now to Exodus once again. Exodus chapter 7 again. And now verse 13. Even in spite of what old Pharaoh saw happen, he hardened his heart. Now it says here that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now this throws a curve at a lot of people, doesn't it? They say, well now is God being fair with poor old Pharaoh that contrary to anything that Pharaoh may have wanted to do, God is making him become the rebel. Well, that's not the way it is. Come back, if you will, to Romans. I guess I should have left you back there when we were in the New Testament. Come back to Romans chapter 9, because after all, the only way we can do these things is search the Scriptures. Romans chapter 9. Come over to verse 14. Where Paul now writes, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Can God be unfair? No way. Verse 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but it all depends on who? God, who is going to show mercy. Now, verse 17. For the Scripture saith unto who? Pharaoh. Here we go. Tying it all together. The Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, For this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. How many people, even on the earth today, in this age of spiritual darkness and ignorance, haven't heard of the Exodus? How many people, even today, don't know at least something about the plagues that came on Egypt? Well, just about everybody does. And out of it, God has intended that he get the glory, not the blame. See, now the human race is tending to say, well, that was God's fault. But that's not the way God intended it to fall. He wants the human race to realize his power, his sovereignty, and in it all, his righteousness, his mercy, see? All right, now verse 18. Therefore, <clears throat> therefore he, God, hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he Hardener. Now, that, that throws a curve at us, doesn't it? Boy, that's hard to comprehend. Verse 19. Thou wilt then say unto me, Why doth he then find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, Paul is asking the question. Well, if God is putting this guy in this kind of a position, then who is God to put the blame on him? Well, now let's read on, because I think Paul's going to answer it for us. Nay, verse 20, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto dishonor? What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted 
to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had before unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentile. Now, that's a tough one to explain. Don't think I don't know it's tough. Number one, God is sovereign. He is absolute in his power. We are in no position to argue what he does or why he does it. The Old Testament says his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways are higher than our ways, and it's not for us to question. But I think realizing that God is righteous, you can be coming back to Exodus, realizing that God is righteous, he can do no sin, he can do no wrong, he gives every human being that exercise of free will. Now, Pharaoh, when he was confronted with letting the Jews go, what could he have done? He could have let them go. But, you see, when God brought him to the point of making a tough decision, and I remember I uh, mentioned a couple weeks ago, what was basis to him not wanting to let them go? It was economics. He couldn't lose all that slave labor without ruining the nation, and it did ruin it when they left. So God brings him to a place of having to make a tough decision. And like the average human being, how did O'Farrell decide? In his own direction. He made his own choice. Now, as we come through all these plagues, after every plague, Moses goes back and says in so many words, well, now, are you ready to let the Jews go? What could Pharaoh have said? Let them go. But instead, what does he say? I'll not let them go. So, I think we see this even in the human nature today. When people are brought to a place of making up their mind for or against God and they say no, the next time it's easier for them to say no than it was the last time. In other words, their whole concept of rebellion grows and their concept of recognizing God's mercy gets smaller and so this is why when people get old now this is not in any way pointing a finger at the elderly but as people get old and they get up into those 80s and 90s and if they are still a rebel against the grace of God it's hard to break through it it is almost impossible because they have become so hardened I know I've talked to a few and, and you just can't get through to them. Sometimes you can. But usually it's so hard because every time that they've been confronted with that choice of believing the gospel and they reject it, it becomes that much harder for them at some future time to break down those barriers of resistance. And so it was with Pharaoh. Every time that Pharaoh would reject the offer to let Israel go, it was that much harder for him to say, let him go, and it was that much easier for him to say, I'll not let him go. So I think this is the only way we can look at the fact that God hardened Pharaoh was that he put him in this place of having to make a decision. And every time he made it, it just simply hardened his whole concept. All right, now then, we know that the plagues begin... And we're not going to take them one by one because I think you're all aware of all the various plagues that came upon Egypt, except I'd like to make this comment. A lot of people can't believe the book of Revelation. They just can't believe that such things are going to come upon the earth. But you know what I always tell them when I teach Revelation? These things have all happened before. Most of what takes place in the tribulation in the book of Revelation are almost a reek run of the plagues on Egypt. Only in the tribulation it'll be worldwide in its scale, whereas here, of course, it was limited to Egypt. But listen, much the same is going to happen. You're going to have the great uh, influx of, uh, of locusts, demonic creatures. You're going to have all of the cosmic disturbances that were no doubt part and parcel of all these things. So if you can believe now, if these things happen back here in Egypt, then you shouldn't have any trouble believe, believing that it's still going to come on the earth once again. All right, now if you'll come on down through chapter 8 with me. Like I said, we'll, we'll skip some of these plagues for sake of time. And come down to verse 20. 
Now the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Now I've got to explain that, because I know I used to wonder, and a lot of people have, how did Moses and Aaron have such access to the king of Egypt? Well, I read, and I, again, I have to, you know, you have to depend on what other people write sometime. But I have read that had this been Babylon, they would have never been able to do it. The Babylonian kings would never allow someone to come before them except in their own court. But the Egyptians did. The Egyptian pharaoh was open to people to come into his presence. And so consequently, Moses and Pharaoh had no obstruction. I mean, Moses and Aaron had no obstruction when they wanted to come before Pharaoh. They came right into his presence. And so here they do here. And so the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up in the early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, verse 21, If thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies or insects upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and in the houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of the swarms of flies or insects, and also the ground whereon they are. But now here's why I jumped this far. Now look at verse 22. And God says to Moses and Aaron, and I'm sure Moses and Aaron repeated it to Pharaoh, I will sever in that day. Now evidently the first two or three plagues struck the Jew as well as the Egyptian. But beginning with this plague, now what does God say? I will sever, I will set apart in that day the land of Goshen wherein the Israelites were dwelling in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, to the end that thou mayest know. Now here it is again, God's proving his point. He is showing the Egyptians that if God can draw an invisible line around Goshen, that even the insects wouldn't cross. I mean, this is something. And he says, I will draw a line around Goshen and they will not have the flies. All right, that they may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Now verse 23, and I will put a division between my people, that is of Israel, and thy people of Egypt. Tomorrow shall this sign be a division, a setting apart of the children of Israel from those of Egypt. Now we're going to see this, as I said last half hour, I think, that all the way up through Israel's history, what is drummed into them? You're different. You're different. You are to be a set-apart people. You are the covenant people. You are to have nothing to do with those pagan Gentiles all around you. All right, there's a New Testament analogy. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians again, if you will. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, now Paul comes on the scene and he gives us the same set of directions. You remember Paul says in Romans chapter 15, I think it's verse 4, all these things are written back in the Old Testament for our learning. We're to learn from this. Now, just as sure as God put a separation between the children of Israel and Egypt, God puts a line of demarcation between the believer and the world. And God says, you cannot serve two masters. We're either going to serve one and hate the other or vice versa. Now look what Paul teaches then in 2 Corinthians. Verse 11, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Now that this is the Apostle Paul just pouring out his innermost being, even though he's by inspiration. He says, you are not straightened in us, but you are straightened in your own innermost being. Now for recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be you also enlarged. In other words, have that same kind of a spiritual relationship. Verse, 13, uh, verse 14, be you not, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, be you not unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. We don't hear that much anymore, do we? We don't hear much about separation. In fact, I maintain this is exactly why Christianity has lost its power.
The average person can't see any difference between the average Christian and the average person of the world. But God didn't intend it that way. Just as sure as he separated Israel from Egypt, he wants to separate you and I from the world. Now, like I said a couple programs ago, not that we're to be oddballs. We aren't to be just constantly asking for persecution by our actions. But the world should know where we stand. So he says, be not unequally yoked together to unbelievers. Come on down to verse 15. What concord or what relationship does the one that believe have with an infidel? See? And so all the way through, we have to be separated. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les. Here is Les Feldick. And good afternoon. It's good to have everybody here. And uh, for those of you on television, we want to again invite you to just be part of our class. This is an informal class. We don't claim to put on any, any airs or try to be theological. We're just going to teach the Word as we trust the Lord has revealed it to me. And uh, I tell so, so people so many times. In fact, I had a call from the Colorado off, uh, audience the other day. And uh, she said, you know what I like about your teaching is you don't just go by what men say. You, you try to go by what the book says. And I said, that's exactly. And I've always attempted to have this approach. Even if people don't agree with me, if I can just get them into the book. And that's what happens a lot of times. If you kind of stir their nest and uh, you say some things that they can't agree with, at least they're going to get into the book and see why they don't agree. And then that, of course, many times brings them around to our point of view. So again, just remember, those of you out in television, this is informal. We don't hew to any denominational line. We just teach the Word as we see it. And we trust you'll be blessed by it. All right, now for those of you here in the studio audience, I'd like to have you turn to Exodus. I said chapter 12, I think. But let's go back for just a moment to chapter 10. Because uh, the last time we were together, we had more or less gotten to the place where Pharaoh was obstinately refusing to let the children of Israel go. And uh, God would bring in a plague, and I've always felt it wasn't necessary to spend a lot of time on the plagues individually because most people know at least a little bit about what took place in the plagues on Egypt. But I would like to make one comment about them. Always remember that if you don't have any problem with the plagues in Egypt, and most people don't, and again, so much of history now confirms the fact that Egypt indeed was in a shambles by the time the Jews left. They were destitute economically in every which way. And most people can agree to that. But when you get into the book of Revelation, they shy away and they just say, oh, you know, I just can't believe that things like that can ever happen. But always correlate that many of the things that took place back here in Egypt under the plagues will repeat themselves in the tribulation only on a worldwide scale instead of just local as it was here in Egypt. And another thing I always like to remind you about is that so many writers, secular as well as even theological people, will always try to somehow associate these events in, in the book of Exodus, the plagues and how these things happen. They try to associate it with natural phenomena that just happened to happen. For example, I was reading one yet just the other night. They said it's not unusual at all for waves of locusts to come into that part of the world. Well, that's true. But when God sent a plague on Pharaoh, it wasn't just a happenstance natural phenomena. It was a miraculous act of God. And uh, they'll try to explain away the, the parting of the Red Sea. And uh, I know many of you have read of it, and you've heard of it, that it was up at the shallower end up there near the Mediterranean Sea, and they went through water 18 inches deep. Well, again, the article I was reading the other night, he explained that away by saying, and of course the chariots couldn't be drowned in 18 inches of water, but again, that area of the world so often has great tidal waves coming in off the Mediterranean, and that could have drowned the Egyptians. Well, you see, that's all just... Excuse the term, but in my language, that's hogwash. That's just bilge water. Because all of these things are the miraculous 
powerful working of an almighty God. And this is the way we have to take it. All right, now then, if you'll come back with me for just a moment, as Pharaoh is now coming under the pressure of all the plagues, and uh, he's trying to do some compromising with Moses, and I don't think we covered them in our last study, but I'll just touch on them. He, he offers three compromises. One I know we touched on, and that is, he said, well, now, if you want to leave, go ahead, but don't go too far. Now, what did he, what did he imply there? Well, don't, don't let yourselves go so far that I lose control of you. Go for a day or two, worship, and be right back. Well, you see, that's exactly how Satan deals with the lost person. The lost person may start getting an appetite, and the Holy Spirit may be wooing him and, and bringing him under conviction. And what's the first thing the old devil says? Well, you can get a little religious, but don't, don't get carried away with it. Uh, go ahead and go to church Sunday morning, but uh, forget about it the rest of the week. See, that, that's Satan's ploy even today. Then secondly, uh, Pharaoh comes back and he says, well now, uh, how many of you are going to go? He said, I'll let your men go, but I want to keep your children. And isn't that, again, exactly how Satan works today? Oh, you know, every parent loves to see their kid get the best of everything. We want to see them be successful. And uh, in our day and time, in this materialistic world we're living in, all we're doing is giving in to, again, the compromise with Satan. Well, yeah, I guess I'll let you have my kids because, after all, they've got to make it in this world. They've, they've got to do what everybody else is doing. But listen, that isn't the Lord's idea. That isn't his approach whatsoever. And uh, then, of course, uh, Pharaoh finally comes to the place where he gets so put out with Moses and Aaron. Now, if you'll look at the scripture with me, he says in verse 28 of chapter 10, Get thee from me. And uh, he said, Take heed to thyself, you'll see my face no more. For in that day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And it's almost enough to bring a smile to your face, Moses' response. Moses knew, because Moses, see, God had told Moses way at the very beginning that the last plague was going to be super special. And this, of course, would be the plague of taking the life of everything that was firstborn. And so when Pharaoh makes this statement now, Moses just comes right back in verse 29, and he said, Thou hast spoken well. Pharaoh, you've just said a mouthful. I will see your face again no more. All right, now then, we get into chapter 11, and, and God in, uh, encourages Moses, and he says, Yet I will bring one more plague upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, and after this one he'll let you go. And, of course, we know that's exactly what happened. And he says down in verse 5, And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits upon a throne, even to the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of what? Even the beasts, even the livestock. Now imagine what that would do to a society or an economy. It just wrecks it. And uh, verse 6, God promises there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it, any more. And then verse 7, but against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move. Now, I know it's interesting that throughout Scripture we get little tidbits of information how that God is even in control of the wildlife or the animal kingdom. Now, here he's going to make sure that even an Egyptian dog won't bark when Israel gets moved out. And then it always takes me up into the New Testament. You know, when uh, Peter was concerned about tax money, what did Jesus tell him to do? Go down to the seashore and there will be a fish with enough money in it for your taxes and mine both. And what does that tell you? He's got control, even of the fish, of the animal kingdom. He is totally a controlling God. All right, so he says, even a dog against man or beast, verse 7, that you may know how that the Lord doth put a, what's the word? Difference. Difference. Now, a lot of times I repeat myself, I know I do, but I do it for a purpose because some of these things they just don't sink in until we get it hammered and hammered and hammered into us. Now all the way up through Israel's history, beginning you might say with Abraham, God is constantly reminding them that they are not like everybody else on the planet, but they're what? They're different. 
They are his covenant people. And they were never to intermarry with anybody but those of the nation of Israel. They were to have no real social contact with the pagan people around them. Naturally, they had to do business with them and so forth. But socially, they were to, re to remain a separated people. And I always like to emphasize, and this shocks people a lot of it, never did God instruct the Jew to go out and proselyte the Gentiles. You know that? They were never instructed to go out and win the Gentiles even to their religion. And, and this is kind of hard to accept because, you know, we're of the opinion that, that God wanted those people. Of course he did, but he didn't want it by virtue of the Jew proselyting, per se, or evangelizing, because he was dealing strictly with this covenant nation of people who he is going to set aside and he's going to make them different. Now I'm saying all this to get you ready for someday when we get to the New Testament, and when the Apostle Paul begins going to the Gentiles, how did the Jews feel about it? Oh, it upset them. See? Who in the world has the right to go to those pagan Gentiles? Well, now, we don't want to come too hard on these Israelites because of that. Because after all, for almost 2,000 years, God has been telling them and proving to them that they were different. They were his separated people. And it took them a long time to get that out of their system. And that's why, of course, uh, Paul and Peter in Galatians chapter 2 have the confrontation that they had. Because, see, Peter just couldn't get that out of his system. That he could go in and sit down and, and maybe have a ham sandwich with those Gentile believers up at Antioch. And so, when his fellow Jews came up from Jerusalem, Paul says, what about Peter? Hey, you withdrew. And Peter went right back to that old mentality that, after all, Jews could not fellowship with Gentiles. But, you see, that's the beauty of the church. Now, in the church age, Paul especially emphasizes that there is now no difference. See? And all it all has to be brought back to the Old Testament, where now God says there is a difference. And let's not forget that. All right, now then, verse 8, <clears throat> And all these thy servants shall come down unto me, and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh will not hearken unto you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel out of his hand. Now we're going to let Pharaoh go for a little bit, and we're going to come into chapter 12, which again is a benchmark chapter, I think, much like Genesis chapter 12, because here we have the introduction of Passover. Passover. Now we've just come through the Passover season, and if you've been reading your daily papers and other areas, you know that the Jews, the Orthodox Jews at least, and some of the other areas of, of uh, Judaism, have been making a, a big ado over Passover. They're still practicing it. They still cleanse their house of leaven from top to bottom. And uh, it all goes back to this institution of, Je of Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> now let's look at it. Verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month, which is now the month that we call April, this month shall be unto you the beginning, or the first of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. In other words, the Jewish calendar now is set up in such a way that April is the first month of their uh, religious year. You know, I don't like to use the word religious, but it's the best one that fits. Now then, verse 3. Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, the first month of your year, in the tenth day you shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Verse 4, if the household be too little or too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. In other words, there is never to be a shortfall. There is always supposed to be enough 
Now, it doesn't say so much about that which is left over because he tells how to deal with that. But they had to make sure that there was not a shortage. And, of course, the lesson is coming in just a moment. Then verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up or pen it up until the 14th day of the same month. Now, what you've got here, of course, is a beautiful illustration of whom? The Lord Jesus. Now, he too was, according to our Bible, without spot, without blemish, without sin. But in order to prove that he was spotless, in order to prove that he was sinless, how long did he minister? Three years. And so as this lamb was kept up for three days to be completely observed, the household was to look for any blemish, any sign of poor health, any sign of anything that may have been wrong with it. And if at, if at the end of those three days the lamb was whole, then they could kill it for the Passover sacrifice. Now it's the same way with Christ. He spent that three years up and down the land of Israel. He was under complete scrutiny by the religious authorities, more or less by the ordinary man in the street. He wasn't hidden from anyone, and yet no one could ever point a finger at him and accuse him of a wrongdoing. He was without spot. He was without blemish. He was blameless. All right, now then, after they had proved the lamb, then verse 7, <clears throat> they were to take of the blood and strike it on the two sides and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they would eat it. <clears throat> Verse 8, And they shall eat the flesh in that night roasted with fire. Now here again comes that beautiful illustration of what his death on the cross really amounted to. The verse following says that they were not to eat it raw, nor sodden at all or boiled in water, but it was to be roasted with fire. Now the fire here, is, as I see it, was indicative of judgment. That just as sure as Christ went through the fires of judgment as he hung on that cross in order to bring about our salvation, this Passover lamb also was roasted with fire. It was not to be fixed any other way but this which indicated a judgment. Now you remember that even as we go on into Israel's religious experience, what happened to all of their sacrifices that were offered upon that brazen altar? Well, they were burned. They were burned with fire. It was the place where sin was being judged. Now, I know we're living in a day and time where we hardly ever hear anything about sin anymore. We don't even know what, what sin is. It, it's just gotten to the place that every man does whatever he thinks is right in his own eyes. You know, I was telling somebody just the other day, I'm always reminded of that last verse of the book of Judges. You might want to look at it and, and mark it down because it is so appropriate for the day in which we find ourselves, even today. The, the, the whole set of circumstances around us fits this verse or this verse fits us. Judges chapter 21 verse 25. And remember the book of Judges is the account of Israel's rise and fall, rise and fall. She would go down to the very depths of sin and rebellion and cry out for help and then God would raise up a judge and then he would bring them out of it and they'd be rather spiritual for a while and then all of a sudden down they'd go again and that, that's the whole account of this book. But as the book ends, verse 25, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know what it was? It was almost anarchy. It was a, a spiritual famine, and Israel was destitute because there was nothing to guide them. And see, we're getting there so fast within our own social fabric. Uh, I have to feel that this is the problem of so much of our inner city, is that these kids are being raised with no direction. 
They are being raised with no restraint. And consequently, their attitude is, I can do whatever I want to do because no one is going to make me account for it. And it's going to do nothing but lead us to more and more trouble as I, as I see the whole picture. All right, now then, if you'll come back with me to Exodus once again. They were to now roast it with fire, and they were to stand at the table as they were eating, and they were to have all their clothes on, verse 11. Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now again, let, let's just get a, a brief picture of the Jews now. They're in Egypt, and they're in their little huts of one sort or another, but uh, evidently they had a tent or a cabin door, and they were to apply the door to the two side posts and to the lintel. Now, I'm convinced that no Jew in Egypt understood what was going on here, but I am just as convinced that God already had the final picture in mind, and that was he was drawing an outline of the cross. Because he doesn't say just put the blood on the door. The implicit instruction was on each side post and on the door top or the lintel. And then he says in verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, plural, of Egypt, will I execute judgment. Now I guess I haven't made a point of that, but you want to realize that every one of the plagues were directed against one of the gods of Egypt. In other words, God just proved that their pagan worship had nothing to do with him whatsoever. He could destroy them at will. And, and always remember that. And I've, I've stressed it ever since we've started our study way back in Genesis, that ever since the Tower of Babel, the whole human race, until Abraham, was saturated in paganism, in polytheism, in other words, the worship of many gods. And so when Israel comes on the scene as his separated, different covenant people, they are the only people on earth. Now, I know that at that time the populated earth was there along the Mediterranean area and on into the Middle East and maybe on out to China. But that, that area of the populated world, every human being except these now coming out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are pagan worshipers of the many gods. Now, that, that's kind of hard to swallow. But it's the, it's the truth of history that all these people of the world are steeped in paganism. And Israel alone is that little group, that little nation, that has a knowledge of the one true God. And I know the first thing we say, well, then why didn't God send the Jew out into those pagans and, and enlighten them? Well, he wanted to in time. But again, he's going to instruct them first. He's going to prepare them. And until they're ready, of course, he's not going to give them that permission. Now, there were exceptions, of course. You know, he sent Jonah up to Nineveh, that Gentile city. And uh, he certainly responded to Naaman, the Syrian general. But other than that, he has nothing to do with these pagan, non-Jewish people as he's dealing only now with the house of Israel. All right, so now on the night of the Passover, the death angel is passing throughout Egypt, and it is killing every of the firstborn of man and beast. But verse 13, God says to the nation of Israel, And the blood that is on the doorpost shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, now if you don't mind marking your Bible, underline that. Because that, that's, that's the crucial point. He doesn't say, if you behave yourselves. He doesn't say, now if you've been living relatively sinless. He doesn't say, if you worship me in a particular way, or if you do this, he says only one thing, and what is it? When I see the blood. When I see the blood, what will he do? I'll pass over you. Now, if you can picture in your mind for just a little bit the gross darkness now that has come upon the land of Egypt, 
And yet up there in Goshen, every Jewish family has put the blood on the doorposts as they were instructed. And as they, as the scripture said they would, as they heard, and, and even old Cecil B. DeMille, you know, in his movie Ten Commandments, he, he made that rather, uh, rather accurate. They could hear the weeping and the wailing and the mourning going on throughout the whole communities of Egypt. And yet every Jew who was behind that door with the blood applied was totally safe. They had nothing to worry about. They had nothing to fear. They were absolutely secure. Not because of anything they had earned, not because of their goodness, not because of anything except one thing. And what was it? The blood on the door. Now that, of course, was an act of faith. If they didn't put the blood on the door, if they would have scoffed and said, well, now, wait a minute. What's three little globs of blood on my house door going to have to do with me, seeing what God is able to do to the Egyptians? Would they have been safe? No. They would have also lost their firstborn. But evidently, because the scripture gives us no indication that any Jews were lost, but evidently every single Jewish household in Goshen had the blood on the door. And they were safe. Now, I haven't got time in this program. We're going to have to do it in our next half hour. We're going to be going into the New Testament, and we're going to see that you and I, as well, if we are under the blood, we're safe, we're secure. And, of course, I always have to qualify that. That doesn't give us license. Never does that give us license. But if we're under the blood, just as sure as those Jews in Goshen, they were safe. They didn't weep and wail and say, well, what if? I haven't been like I should have been the last week. And you know, they were sinners just like we are. But yet, the blood applied made them totally safe and secure. And uh, like I said, I haven't got time in this program, but we're going to, in the next half hour, we're going to go into Romans and Ephesians and some of these others. And we're going to see how that this whole exodus from Egypt was God's redemption of the nation. And it was based first upon a person, which was Moses in his case. And it was upon the blood, the Passover lamb in this case. And thirdly, the word is power. We're going to come to that in some future moment when the power of God is going to be exercised not so much now in all the plagues that have come on Egypt, but when Israel stands before the Red Sea and with no way out. And then what happens? The power of God moves in and the sea opens up. And that's why we have to, again, take for granted that it was not at some easy place of crossing, but it was where it was the deepest. And they went across on dry ground. Thank you for watching Through the Bible just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. And again, good afternoon. It's good to have everybody with us. And we want you to turn to Exodus chapter 12. Once again, we'll pick up where we left off. For those of you on television, we want you to just be part and parcel. I know there are a lot of people constantly writing to us that they have just now begun to watch our program. And so for those of you who have missed everything from Genesis 1 all the way up until the present time, all these programs are on VCR tapes. We've put 12 programs on a tape, and uh, we now have seven of them complete. And if you're interested in it, and the tapes are creating a lot of interest, you write to us, you call us, and uh, we'll be glad to get them in your hands. Now, for those of you, again, in the studio audience, and for those of you who are studying with us out in television, turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. And remember when we closed in our last program, we were explaining how that the blood was to be applied to the doorposts. And, uh, and then as they were preparing to leave, they were to ask the Egyptians for whatever they would give them for their journey. And of course, God had this all set up sovereignly because you want to remember they have been slaves now for many, many years. And God's going to see to it they get their wages, back wages. And he's going to cause the Egyptians to just literally give everything they've got to these parting Israelites.
with good wishes, get out from our midst, you're nothing but a bunch of trouble, and so they spoil Egypt. But before that happens, I'd like to take you now into chapter 12, verse 22, and again, it's an important verse, I think, because here are the explicit instructions of how to apply the blood. They weren't just supposed to do it any old which way, but it had to be done in a particular way. And verse 22 of Exodus 12 says that they were to take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Now hyssop, of course, was a little bush or a little weed that grew everywhere in Goshen. I always like to liken it to the ragweed here in our part of the world. I mean, every place you look, there's ragweed, unless they have been rooted out. And they were to take this little weed and, of course, dip it into the basin of the lamb's blood and then apply the blood to those three places on the doors and on the lintel. Now, I like to liken the, the hyssop here to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I may be wrong, but I, I think we've got a good application that as hyssop was everywhere, not a single Israelite could say, well, now, I didn't have a chance to find a little bush of hyssop. I couldn't do it that way. Neither can anyone ever say, well, the Holy Spirit never worked in my life. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He works on every human being. And I am firmly convinced that every person that has ever lived, the Holy Spirit has given them opportunity to accept or reject God's salvation. And so hyssop was common. No Israelite could ever say, I didn't have a chance. Now, I know when I say some things, somebody is bound to say, well, where do you get that? <clears throat> so keep your hand in Exodus. We'll be right back. <clears throat> Go with me to the book of Titus. Way back in your New Testament, Titus chapter 2, because I always like to have folk understand that when I make a statement, I hopefully can back it up with Scripture. If I can't, then it's just so much hot air and it means nothing. But here in Titus chapter 2, drop down to verse 11. Now, Titus is back with all the T's. They're all bunched together, the Thessalonians and the Timothys and Titus. Chapter 2, verse 11, where Paul writes to Titus, For the grace of God, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath, past tense, it's already been done, hath appeared unto how many? Oh. All men. Now, the Scripture doesn't lie. The Scripture does not lie. The grace of God, through the working of the Holy Spirit, has appeared unto, I think, every human being in one way or another. Now, Romans, of course, chapter 1 tells us that one way God does speak, even to pagans and those who have never heard the, the literal Word of God, is through the effect of nature. They should be able to look into the very starry expanse and realize that there's a Creator to deal with. That's what the Scripture says. But the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And uh, all of Scripture is constantly referring to that fact that even though all of sin, and we're going to be looking at that more in depth in, in not this program, maybe the next one, that even though all of sin, the way back to God has made, been made available for every human being. In fact, go back with me now during the New Testament. Stop at John's Gospel. Thought just comes to mind of John's Gospel, chapter 10, the great new uh, shepherd chapter. The Good Shepherd chapter, <clears throat> John's Gospel chapter 10, where Jesus is speaking, of course, during his earthly ministry, and he makes such a perfect application of what I'm just speaking, that no one has been shut out from God's great plan of salvation. And he uses it here in the, in the area of a sheepfold and the sheep. Verse 1. Jesus speaking says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. In other words, he's saying you can't just pick and choose. There's only one way. 
Now read on. Verse 2, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter, or the doorkeeper, openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. He calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. Then drop down to verse 5, just for sake of time, And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And then verse down, or come down to verse 9, where Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be what? Saved. See? He's the door. Now, over the last 20 years of teaching, I've, I've asked this question over and over. Where is the door to the sheepfold? Now, even though you've never been to the Middle East and maybe not even an area of the world where you have any knowledge of sheep, but I think anybody can pretty well picture if you've got a, a place of safety for the sheep at night, which they call the fold, where was the door to the sheepfold? On ground level. It wasn't a hundred feet up in the air. It wasn't down in some cave. It wasn't across some raging river. The door to the sheepfold was ground level. Now, what's the analogy? So is our salvation. Salvation is always right at ground level. We don't have to climb a high mountain. We don't have to pay a million dollars. We don't have to shape up. And any of these things that so many people have associated with God's salvation, it's at ground level. And the Holy Spirit has, doing, is, has been doing His work, is doing His work, in order to bring us to the place that we walk through that door by faith. All right, now then, come back quickly with me then to Exodus chapter 12 again. And so after they have applied the blood, of course, the death angel passed through Egypt, and all the firstborn of beast and man are now lying dead, even in the house of Pharaoh himself. And so there is great weeping and wailing. And now if you'll come down to verse 35, after this last plague now, the stage is set, and the people, uh, the children of Israel, verse 35, did according to the word of Moses. They asked of the Egyptians. Now the King James, I know, uses the word borrowed, and it's unfortunate, because when you borrow something, what do you expect it to do? Give it back. And God never intended that. So it's a, a mistranslation, I think, in our King James. It should be they were to ask. They were merely to ask the Egyptians, do you have anything with which to send us on our journey? And they asked of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and the Lord... Now see, God was instrumental here. The Lord gave the people, that is, of Israel, favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they, and again the word should be, they gave unto them such things as they required, and by doing it they what? They spoiled Egypt. Now, don't lose sight of the fact that by the time we get to Exodus chapter 25, God is going to give instructions to Moses and Aaron to now build what? The tabernacle. And where are they going to get all the gold and the silver and the precious stones to build that tabernacle? Well, from the Israelites who have received it from the Egyptians. So you see, God isn't just spoiling Egypt to pad the pocket of the Israelis. He is looking for something that he's going to use himself in the building of the tabernacle. So now keep all that in mind until we get there. All right, now then in chapter 12, continue on in verse 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses, that's up there in the delta area of, of Egypt, up there in Goshen. And they journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, 600,000 on foot that were men, besides the children and the women, of course. And then on top of all that, and unfortunately, you remember I, uh, in our last taping, I used the figure that I was sure there were from 3 to 7 million in this exodus. Boy, you know, the Lord always gives me comfort. Shortly after that, I was reading an article in the Jerusalem Post, and the rabbi used almost the identical figures, only I think he used three to five. And then the other day, some good lady sent me a National Geographic, clear back from 1976, that was dealing with Moses and the Exodus. And the same figure was in there. I think it was two and a half million, all based on this 600,000 of footmen. But... <laughs> 
Not only were there 600,000 young Jewish men, but in the very next verse, verse 38, what also went out with them? A mixed multitude. Now, I'll bet most of you have often wondered, well, who are mixed multitudes? Well, they were the hangers-on, probably a lot of Egyptians and maybe foreigners who had been laboring in Egypt as well as, as the Jews, but whatever they were, they were not Jews themselves. The mixed multitude were hangers-on who saw a good thing, perhaps, and they decided to go along with them. They are not so much in the spiritual realm, but as, what shall I say, I, I think they become something that, that is just like a parasite. And as you get out into the wilderness experience and they begin to murmur, you know who the first ones are to always start murmuring? This mixed multitude. And so I was telling someone sometime who was decrying that uh, so many of the churches today have got problems and so many are splitting and so many are, are having one problem or sort. And I couldn't help it. I said, well, I said, you know, that really all goes back to the mixed multitude of Exodus. And they said, mixed multitude, what are you talking about? Well, I said, the mixed multitude were not true Israelis. And I said, I think most of our problems in our churches today, the murmurers and the complainers, are usually, not always, but are usually the unsaved element in the church. They have no real spiritual concern. They have no real spiritual knowledge. But you see, they can pick and they can destroy simply because the very good of the local body is not so much in their heart as maybe a little finer furniture, a little more beautiful music, a bigger organ. And you know, it's amazing how many churches have been literally broken over these secular things that, that really don't count that much. I remember years ago, a lady from a different denomination than ours was complaining to my wife at work one day that they were having church problems and they were about to split. And you know what it was over? The color of the upholstery of their pews. They couldn't decide whether they wanted gold or blue or whatever the case may be. But you see, that's mixed multitude working. The murmurers and the complainers. All right, now then, verse 39. They had baked unleavened cakes of dough. Now, I think most of you are aware that leaven in Scripture always speaks of what? Evil. Sin. But I like to use the word evil. Leaven always denotes sin. And you know, leaven is yeast. I think you all know that. And whenever you put yeast in bread dough, it is going to affect the whole lump. And of course, that's the teaching of Scripture. That whenever leaven comes in, evil, unless it is rooted out, it's going to sooner or later affect the whole. So now, leaven here, speaking of evil, was to be left out of their bread dough as they make this exodus out of Egypt. They were to take unleavened bread. Because the picture in type, of course, is that they are to be now a separated people, separated unto God, no longer wrapped up in the paganism of their Egyptian masters. All right, now then, verse 40 and 41, we alluded to this a couple weeks ago, that the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Now, remember that 430 years, as we taught it way back several weeks ago, was from the time that Abram, and his name was still Abram, had left Haran. After having come up the Euphrates Valley, maybe I better get my map up here again, and as he came down then into the land of Canaan and sojourned up and down the land, from that point until Jacob goes over to Egypt from Beersheba, From that period of time until Jacob goes is 215 years. And from the time that Jacob comes over here to Goshen with Joseph, uh, Jacob comes in with, with Joseph over here in Goshen is the next 215 years. And again, after the last taping, I read the Jerusalem Post and one of the rabbis article used again the same, the same year's number, 215 years from the time that Jacob came in until, now look at the next verse, verse 41, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years. In other words, from the time that Abram came down into Canaan 
with a promise that this would one day be his, or at least for his posterity, until Jacob is told to go on into Egypt, is 215, from Jacob's coming into Egypt until the Exodus is another 215, within a matter of six months? No. Look what verse 41 says. Even the what? Self same day. Now all I'm saying this for is so you understand that the Word of God is so true, it is so accurate, God is in such complete control of time and events that He doesn't miss 430 years by 24 hours. But the exact day of the 430 years ending, Israel moves out of Egypt. All right, now then I'm going to come on as quickly as we can all the way over to chapter 13 where God now institutes the setting aside of the firstborn. And uh, that was always indicative, of course, of, of a family relationship throughout the tribes of Israel. And uh, after he establishes that, verse 18... Well, let's look at verse 17. It came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that is, after the night of the Passover, that God led them not through the way of the Philistines, which, of course, would be up here in the short route. Here were the Philistines, right about in here. And so God didn't let them take that route, and that's why I know they didn't cross the Red Sea up here at the high point. But they come out of Goshen, and now I guess I'm getting too low to get the picture. But anyway, let's put the Sinai Peninsula out here somewhere. And the Red Sea comes up on, on both sides. And uh, now over here is a Mediterranean coast, and here's Goshen. Now they come down the shore of the Red Sea, and somewhere along at the very deeper part of this body of water. Now over here will be Mount Sinai, remember approximately. We don't know for sure. But somewhere in this area of the Red Sea, they're going to be locked in with mountains over here. There are going to be populated areas along the Nile here. And coming in from the rear will be Pharaoh's army, his chariots. Now I want you to get that pictured in your mind. The Red Sea is in front of them. Forbidding mountains to the right, population to the left, and the armies are coming in behind. Verse 20. Well, no, let's see. I, I, I skipped a couple of verses. Verse 18. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Now, the top end of this body of water where it's 18 inches deep, the reeds, that is not wilderness. That's populated. The wilderness doesn't approach until you get further down along the Red Sea. And so I'm convinced they had to have crossed down here at the deeper portion. And, of course, it wouldn't be much of a miracle to go through 18 inches of water, would it? But he led them out through the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed. Now, what do you suppose that word's in there for? Harnessed. Well, stop and think. For three to seven million people to move completely out of one area of the nation and to be encamped clear down here on the Red Sea and ready to go through as the waters part, do you think that was a common experience? For years this has bothered me. How in the world did that many people move that far in such a short period of time? Have you ever thought about it that way? And how did they get through that Red Sea in such a short period of time? That many, plus all their livestock. Land, you know how slow herds of cattle and sheep move. Well, the only conclusion I've come to, and of course I can't prove it from Scripture, except there are some verses that indicate it, and maybe I can uh, take you over and let you look at it right now. It'd be in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19, verse 4. Because I, I want to impress upon anybody I teach that the God of Israel is a God who is constantly performing the miraculous. Exodus 19, 
Now, not the miraculous as we think of miracles today, but I mean real miraculous events. This had to be one. It, this had to be a miraculous thing. And look what he says in verse 4. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. In other words, drowned them in the Red Sea. And how I bear you, that is, the Israelites, on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, we know they didn't fly. They didn't sprout wings and fly. They walked. But I have to think that somehow or other, how I wouldn't have the foggiest idea, but somehow God moved that whole group of people somehow, speedily, without their even realizing it. It was just a miraculous move. And again, uh, I think during the tribulation, the 144,000 are going to experience that same kind of travel. They're going to be able to go from place to place with utmost speed and not even realize they're doing it. And, and I have to think that something transpired here that hastened their move out of uh, out of Egypt. All right, now then, if you'll come back again to where we just left off. In chapter 12, they were to eat the Passover. Everyone was to have been circumcised, whether they were Jews or whether they were servants or whatever. And they, of course, were obedient to all that. And then in chapter 13, that's, that's where we were, I guess, before we came in here, is that the firstborn of Israel are set apart. And now then verse 20 of chapter 13. No, I skipped verse 19. I'm sorry. Got to take that one. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, that is, Joseph had, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you." Now all of this should tell us something. And again, so many of the writers and the historians comment on this, they, they always leave the, the miraculous and the supernatural out of it, don't they? And they wonder how all of this came to be. But listen, some of these people, not all, but some of these people had known by faith that these things would happen to God's covenant people. Joseph knew that the time was coming when God would take them back up to Palestine. We know that Moses' parents, when they saw that he was a proper child, they knew by faith that God was still in their midst. And so even now, as Moses and Aaron are preparing to move the children of Israel out of Egypt, where do they know they're going? Palestine, see? And so they take the bones of Joseph with them. Now, in our closing moments, they took their, verse 20, they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord, verse 21, went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light day and night. Now again, this same article I read by this historian was making the conjecture that there was probably a volcano at the time. And that the dust provided that cloud during the day and the volcanic fire was the fire by night. Ridiculous. This was a supernatural cloud, which was the very presence of Jehovah, a cloud by day that gave them shade from that mid-east sun, and then it became a pillar of fire by night which gave them light to carry on their activities. And so it was a supernatural cloud, but the scripture makes it so plain, who was that cloud? It was Christ, it was Jehovah, it was God the Son in his Old Testament personality. And don't ever take anything away from that, because later on in the book, when the tabernacle is completed, what happens to the cloud? Well, it sets right over the Holy of Holies. And it becomes the guiding light of Israel. Whenever it's time for them to move and, and camp someplace else, what happens? The cloud lifts up and moves. When it stops, they were to set the tabernacle so that the Holy of Holies was under the cloud. The cloud was not an accident. It was the absolute presence of God. And you know, this is what amazes me. How could those Jews 
seeing that cloud every day and that fire as they went to bed at night, how could they still be so disobedient and still so prone to sin as they were? Well, again, let's bring it up into our own present time. Are we any different? We're no different. We've got just as much evidence of the power of God. We've got just as much evidence of His holiness, just as much evidence of His hatred for sin. But does it scare us? Not really. Not really. So we have become just about as blasé about a lot of these things as the Israelites were in spite of everything that God was doing in their very midst. And never lose sight of that. These things you believe literally, and you'll never get in trouble. Don't try to explain them away. Don't try to rationalize them. You just read it and you say, this is the way it was. And because after all, what does God say? Without faith, it is impossible to what? Please Him. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Faith. And again, good afternoon, and we'll continue on right where we left off, because again, as we've said so often, time is so precious. I'm going to have you turn right off the bat to Exodus chapter 14. You remember in our last program, we left Israel now down on the shores of the Red Sea, and uh, the Egyptians, of course, by now are coming in behind them with the chariots, the Red Sea in front of them, the mountains to the right, and populated areas probably to the left, and everything seems hopeless, doesn't it? Put yourself in their shoes. No wonder they were scared stiff, as we'd say. But uh, drop down to verse 13 of Exodus 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. What's the next two words? Stand still. Can you imagine how those people must have thought under those circumstances and then have their leader say, stand still? You know, every time I read this verse, I, I normally don't ascribe much to humor because I'm no comedian, but I always have to think when I read this verse of a story, and I'm sure you've all heard it or probably read it, of the little fellow that came home from Sunday school and uh, his unchurched, unbible-taught dad said, well, son, what'd you learn today? And the kid said, well, he said, we learned all about Moses crossing the Red Sea and how as they came up against the sea and all the Egyptian army behind them, the engineers threw up pontoon bridges and they all went across. And then just when the Egyptians came up after him, he says, they pushed the plunger and blew them all up. And the dad, as unchurched as he was, said, now, wait a minute, son. He said, is that what they taught you in Sunday school? And he says, well, no. But he said, if I'd tell you what they told me, you wouldn't believe it anyway. <laughs> well, you know, that is exactly how the world takes these things. They, they want to somehow rationalize it, how it could have happened naturally by ordinary events, but listen, these things aren't ordinary. These aren't just commonplace. This is the miracle working power of God. Now, I put on the board during break time that the book of Exodus, as we first introduced it, is the book of redemption. Israel, of course, was God's covenant people. But by virtue of the sin of the brothers when they sold Egypt, uh, Joseph into Egypt, Spiritually, what happened between God and his people? Well, they were separated. He lost them. And they end up down in Egypt in bondage without an altar, without a sacrifice, without a worship. And, and they had been totally alienated. So now what is God going to have to do? He's going to have to buy them back. He's going to have to redeem them. And so this is the whole process then of the Exodus is a redemption whereby God is going to do the redeeming. Israel is in a position where she can do nothing. They don't have any armed forces. They don't have any economic clout, no political clout. They're just slaves. They're servants. They're helpless. Now, throughout the book of Exodus, then, we find that redemption is going to require a person, in the person of Moses, of course. Now, Moses had to be proven as the legitimate leader, the legitimate deliverer by virtue of what? Way back there at the beginning. What did he have to do? Remember? He performed the sign miracles. 
Remember, he threw his rod on the ground, became serpents, put his hand in his bosom, became leprous, put it back in, and it was healed. Well, all these were to prove to the Jew that Moses was indeed God's man to deliver them. All right. Now, the person so far as we're concerned with in our redemption process was the Lord Jesus, who in his three years of earthly ministry, again, what did he do? He proved who he really was by virtue of his miracles. And he validated his claim that he was indeed the Redeemer of Israel. Secondly, all the way through the book of Exodus, and especially now here in chapter 12 and 13, we've seen that God required the blood of a lamb. It had to be placed on the doorpost or they would have never survived. You bring it into the New Testament, our lamb, of course, is who? It's Christ, and the New Testament substantiates that. Keep your hand in Exodus and go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> chapter 5. 1 Corinthians, chapter 5. Drop all the way down to verse 7. 1 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 7, where Paul now writes, Purge out therefore the old leaven, and again it's a reference to evil, to sin, that you may be a new lump, as you, believers now, are unleavened. Our sin problem has been removed by virtue of our forgiveness, by virtue of our salvation. We are now to be an unleavened people. For even, now here it comes, for even Christ our what? Our Passover, see? He was our Passover lamb. Even as Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now then if you'll come back to Exodus again, we come down to the third step now in these next few verses. God is going to have to bring about their redemption by exercising His power. Israel is not going to be able to throw up a pontoon bridge. Israel is not going to be able to requisition ships and boats and go across the Red Sea. They're going to have to wait on the power of God. For us, the power of our salvation is epitomized, now by epitomizing I mean it's brought to its crescendo at the resurrection. It's the power of the resurrection of Christ that makes our salvation possible. Otherwise, the scripture says we are yet dead in our sins. All right, now then if you look again at verse 13 of chapter 14, it almost seems like a ridiculous answer to their dilemma. And again, I, I want to emphasize, there is no hope. They're locked in, and the enemy is pursuing them from the rear. The, the clouds of dust are rising up within their view. And now Moses says, stand still. Why? Because there's nothing they can do, and only God can provide the answer. And so what does he do? He opens the Red Sea, and uh, now let's read on. Verse 13, he says, Fear not, stand still, and see the, what's the next word? The salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen, you shall see them again no more forever. In other words, God is not only going to let Israel escape, he's going to destroy their enemy. You got the picture? Now, how does that apply to us? Well, let's go back to the New Testament. I'd like to have you start with 1 Corinthians. We'll try to take it as much in a book-by-book -book order as we can, so you won't have to go back and forth too often. But uh, let's start with 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, and come down to verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. I don't like to start until I see you've all got it. All right? For the preaching of the cross. 
Now, I think I've mentioned it before, but I think it bears mentioning again. Have you ever realized that Paul never mentions Bethlehem? He never mentions the birth of Christ. He never makes any reference, so to speak, of his earthly ministry, of his miracles, all those things. Why? Because Paul only has one message. And what is it? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The shed blood. That's the very core of his whole message in all of his epistles. And here is what he's re uh, alluding to again. For the preaching of the cross, see? Not the preaching of Christ and his miracles. Had an interesting conversation with a lady who called again from the Denver uh, audience. And uh, she just expressed how she enjoyed the, the program. I think I alluded to it uh, a couple programs ago. But in the closing of our conversation, she made a statement like this, that uh, she said, after all, we have to go by what Jesus said. And I said, well, now, hold it just a minute. Be careful how you say that. I said, you got to realize that what Jesus said in his earthly ministry, he said to the Jew under the law. And you always have to take that into consideration. And I could tell by the little stop in her voice that uh, we had set her to thinking. But I said, when you go to the epistles of Paul, Paul is revealing to us the very words of the same Jesus, but now from his glorified, ascended position as the resurrected Lord and Savior. Now that makes a big difference. And this is why Paul never ref, uh, refers back to his earthly ministry, but only to the resurrected Christ, where the power of God was made so evident so far as we are concerned. All right, so he says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. In other words, to those who just simply reject it and ridicule it and scorn it, because it's to them foolishness. My, you know, how many people try to say, well, what's something that took place 2,000 years ago got to do with me today? Hey, it's got everything to do with us today because it's the eternal God who was on that cross. But the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them, but unto us who are saved, who have believed it, that preaching becomes what? The power, and that's the word I want you to underline. It's the power of God. <clears throat> just as sure, <clears throat> excuse me, just as sure as God opened the Red Sea <clears throat> by His power, God also exercises His power not only in resurrecting Christ from the dead, but bringing us out of our deadness in sin and in slavery to it. Then come on down to verse, uh, oh, let's see, in the same chapter. Verse 24, <clears throat> but unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the what? The power of God and the wisdom of God. So we have to rely upon that power. Now I'd like to have you come back to Ephesians. I said I'd try to keep it in order. So let's go from Corinthians through the Galatians and into Ephesians. Chapter 1. And we're going to see almost all three aspects of these three steps in the redemption of Israel <clears throat> right here in Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul again is writing <clears throat> to the Gentile believers in the area in which he had ministered throughout the book of Acts there in the western end of Asia Minor or what we know of as today as Turkey. And so to the Ephesians, he writes in chapter 1, verse 7, in whom, and who's the in whom referring to? To Christ, of verse 5. In whom we have redemption. We've been bought back, how? Through his blood. Now, I know a lot of people <clears throat> are repelled by that. I can't help that. And as I've said in earlier programs, you have to understand that God, in his sovereign way of doing things, decided that it would be through the shed blood that he would be able to forgive sin in no other way. And we just have to take that by faith. I have a personal idea why he chose the blood is because life is in the blood and you cannot have new life until death takes place and 
life again comes out of that death of a previous life. And that's what the death, burial, and resurrection is all about. So God has mandated that there can be no salvation, there can be no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. It's mandatory. All right, so here it is. We have redemption then, verse 7, through his blood. And not only are redeemed, we're what? We're forgiven. The forgiveness of sins according to what we deserve? No, it's not what it says. According to his grace, his unmerited faith. We don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Nobody does. But it's by his grace that he's seen, seen fit to do it. And uh, then if you'll come down to verse 12, all this God has done that we should be to the praise of his glory. How many people, and I, I'm afraid too many times, this is especially when, when we have children saved, are merely saved as a fire escape. They, they just want to not go to hell. They want to go to heaven. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But listen, we're not just saved to escape hell. We're not saved just to go to heaven. We're saved for what? To be to the praise of his glory in this life, right now. This is why God has paid the price of our redemption, that we can be to the praise of his glory, those of us who first trusted in Christ. We have believed. see? It doesn't say to you who were baptized and joined the church. It doesn't say to you who have done good works. It says to those who have praised him and have brought him glory. See? All right, now let's go on. That verse 13, in whom also you trusted after, now watch the sequence here, after you heard the word of truth. How many times haven't I heard someone say, well, I have always been a Christian? Have you ever heard that? Does that fit this? Were you a Christian before you heard the word of truth? Impossible. And so it always scares me when I, and I've had real close friends use that expression. Well, I've always been a Christian. Listen, was Israel always free? No. Israel had to come to the place where she recognized, here we are over here, they're up against the Red Sea. Israel is up against it. There is nothing she can do. She's doomed until what? The power of God enters in. And that's her escape. Now, it's the same way with our salvation today or tonight or tomorrow or whatever. Every last one of us were separated from God. We were in the bondage of sin. And we had to come to that place where the power of God... Now a verse just comes to mind. I'm not through here with Ephesians, but hold your finger there and we'll come back to it. Turn with me a minute to Colossians where the power of God is the only thing that can do it. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. Now don't lose Ephesians. I want to come right back to it. But in Colossians chapter 1, dropping down to verse 12, where Paul, of course, has been praying for the Colossi believers here. And he says, strengthened with all might, verse 11, according to his glorious power. Now verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet or who hath prepared us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who, speaking of God the Father, hath, past tense now, if we're a believer, who hath delivered us from the power of what? Darkness, out of slavery. Egypt was in the darkness, or Israel was in the darkness of slavery back there in Egypt. But what brought them out? The power of God. All right, now read on. It's God the Father then who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath, again, past tense. It's not something we're working toward. It's not something we're hoping for. It's something that we have right now. And he hath translated us from that darkness into what? Into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, we were talking at break time. You know, it, it just opened my eyes when someone asked me a question years ago, why heaven isn't taught in the Old Testament. 
why the Jew had no concept of dying and going to heaven. Well, my answer to that, of course, was Israel was an earthly people with earthly promises. But you see, we in the age of grace now are a heavenly people with what kind of promises? Heavenly. See? And so here we have it. Even though we're here on the earth tonight, yet where is our citizen? Where our citizenship, rather? It's in heaven. We are already a heavenly people by the power, I don't want to get away from that, by the power of God. All right, come back to Ephesians, if you will. Now, I hope you kept it so you don't take time to look for it. Now back to Ephesians, and again in verse 13. Speaking of Christ in verse 12, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Now, I'm emphasizing that because I've had so many people come up after I've taught this little verse, and they'll say, well, this is the first time I saw the order. This is no way I could have been saved as an infant. There's no way I could have been saved by something that someone else did for me. I had to hear the word of truth. And I'll take you right back to the shores of the Red Sea again. Neither could Israel move out of that slave experience except for the power of God. Now they're going to, by faith, walk through. I know that. But yet God exerts his power while they could do how much? Nothing. Nothing. And that's where you and I are. But we have to come to that place where we recognize our hopelessness. There's nothing you and I can do to get us out of that hopeless estate of being lost in sin. All right, now read on. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation. Now, I'm not going to take time to look at it. I'll give the reference for those of you in television. Write it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, where Paul says that by the gospel you are saved. And that gospel is that Christ was crucified, he was buried, and he what? He rose from the dead. That's the gospel. See? That's the gospel. Now, implied, of course, in his death is the shed blood. We can't leave that out. But the gospel is that body of truth, which I usually like to just concentrate by saying, the finished work of the cross. The finished work of of the cross. That's what opens our Red Sea that is out in front of us. It's that work of the cross that takes us away from the power of the Egyptian army behind us, or the power of Satan in our word. But whatever, after that you believed, the rest of the verse says. See? Now again, I always like to point out in Scripture the things that are not there. How many people would like to put it this way? In whom you also trusted, after that you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after you believed and were baptized and joined the church, and blah, 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 blah. Isn't that right? But it isn't in there. The Bible is so plain that our salvation comes by believing, plus how much? Nothing. Because Christ has done it all. I told one of my class again the other night, and I think we probably shook up one lady for sure. And she said, well, no less. She said, I've been baptized in such and such a way, but she said, I just wanted to get to heaven. Well, now that's noble. But listen, you don't get to heaven by being baptized. You get to heaven by trusting and believing the gospel. And then all these other things, of course, will follow in their rightful place. But see how plain it is? in whom also after that you believed, period, plus nothing. And then what did God do? He sealed us. He sealed us with that Holy Spirit of promise. And then Paul goes throughout all his epistles and explains that the moment we believe the gospel or we were, uh, we were saved, we were born again, what happened so far as the Holy Spirit was concerned? He indwells us. See, he empowers us and he keeps us. All right, now I got to, we're in Ephesians. I got to look at a couple more verses before this half hour is gone. Come on over into chapter 2. And again, I want to take you back to the hopelessness of Israel and of a lost person as we are, figuratively speaking, encamped on the shores of the Red Sea. The enemy behind us, locked in from both sides, and the opposition of the Red Sea in front of us. 
here it is in Ephesians 2, and you, Ephesians 2, verse 1, and you, Paul says, as he writes to believers, he hath quickened or made alive who were dead. We were on the other side of the Red Sea in trespass and sins. Now look at verse 2 and 3. Isn't this the exact picture of Israel in Egypt and of you and I before we were saved? Look at it. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? Satan. Satan himself, the devil. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we... What's the next word? All. See? Some of us didn't escape this. We were all here among whom also we all had our conversation or our manner of living in times past in the lust or the desires of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's where we were. But all oh, look at those next two words. What is it? But God. Oh, don't lose that. But God. Paul doesn't say, but you. Paul doesn't say, but I, but what? But God. Now, come right back to the Red Sea again. Here was Israel. Stand still, Moses says, and see the salvation of God. What's he saying? Oh, we're locked in. There's nothing we can do. But God, see? But God. And what's God going to do? Open the Red Sea. And that's exactly what he's done for us. And we walk through on dry ground. Not by anything that we have done or deserve, but all because of what Christ has done for us in and through us. Now read on. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead, we were hopeless, we were helpless, he quickened us together with Christ. And then I'll close with two choice verses. Most of you probably know them from memory. For by grace are you saved. How? Through faith. See? Plus anything else? No. Nope. Through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the... What's the next word? Do you work for a gift? A real gift? Do you deserve it? No. A gift is something that somebody extends to you for really no reason. And there's nothing you can do to merit it, see? All right. And then verse 9 and 10, not of works. See how plain that is? There was nothing Israel could do. They could have tried. It wouldn't have done them any good. They didn't have time. But they were to stand still. And that's where God wants us, to the place where there is nothing we can do but simply and completely trust the finished work of Christ. Now, don't let that slip away from your memory. The finished work of Christ is what makes our escape possible. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding, a weekly Bible study. Now, here is Les Feldick. And again, it's good to have everybody back with us. And for those of you on television, if you haven't watched our program before, we are just simply taking the scriptures from Genesis and the Lord tarries. We hope to go all the way through one day to the whole book of Revelation. But in the meantime now, pick, us, pick it up with us in the book of De Exodus, chapter 14, and we want to keep moving on. And uh, again, for those of you watching on television, if we ever leave you with a question, please feel free to call us on our 800 number. We appreciate them. Now in Exodus 14, as God has now opened the Red Sea by virtue of Moses stretching his rod over the waters, it's opened up and they walk through on dry land. And now if you come in at verse 26 of chapter 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand, and the sea returned to his strength. And when the morning appeared, the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And, of course, the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much 
as one of them. Now, the scripture does not indicate whether Pharaoh himself led his armies. I rather doubt it. And uh, if history is correct that Ramesses II was the Pharaoh at this time, then he certainly wasn't because they're quite sure that one of the mummified pharaohs that are still over there was indeed this same pharaoh. But whatever, the scripture leaves us unaware as to whether or not Pharaoh himself was drowned, but none of the others were left. God had completely destroyed them. And then verse 29, it makes it clear once again, but the children of Israel walked upon dry land, in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall on their right and on their left. And again, I have to discredit, I guess is the word, uh, the movie Ten Commandments because you would never run three to seven million people and all of their livestock and their herds through that narrow channel as they showed it in the movie. Now, I know they did quite well with what technology they had. But I'm, again, convinced that not only did God move this whole multitude miraculously faster than just a three-mile-an-hour walk, but also he must have opened the Red Sea an amazing amount of distance. He had to have in order for that large a multitude to go through within such a short period of time. But whatever. How he did it, how much he did it, we know he did it. The Scripture says so. We believe it. And the picture, again, as we hopefully brought out as clearly as I know how in our last program, was a picture of our own salvation. It is actually indicative, of course, of the burial of Christ. And coming out on the other side is resurrection. And, uh, well, maybe we should look at a verse in Romans. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6. I think most of my class people are aware, and I'm sure most television people are becoming aware that I do not teach according to a written format. As these things come to mind, I have to just stop and we'll go and check them out. But you see, in Romans chapter 6, Paul makes it so plain that we too have to be identified with the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. Even as Israel was separated from Egypt and went through that, that typical burial of the Red Sea, even though they didn't get wet, in type it was their burial, their death to Egypt, and they came out on the other side even as Christ came from the grave, and we too. Now if you'll come down to Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now, I may have a lot of people flap at this, but I am convinced in my own mind that this is not a water baptism because water baptism cannot do what Paul is talking about. And that is that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of Father, even so we also walk in newness of life. Now, no baptism can give new life. Only the power of God can do that. So I am convinced, contrary to the way maybe I was raised and taught in my earlier years, that this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And maybe I didn't intend to do this. Evidently, the Spirit is leading for a reason. But turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, keeping your hand in Romans 6. We're going to come right back to it. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is what I consider the only valid baptism for us in this age of grace. And it's a baptism that human hands cannot touch. It's a baptism that a lost person can have no part in. As over in water baptism, we can never be sure as to a person's salvation. Now, I was brought up in a congregation where we examined very thoroughly any candidates for baptism. And yet I've come to the conclusion in my later years that there is no way a group of men or a group of pastors or a group of ecclesiastics of any kind can truly determine a person's salvation.
Oh, we can hear their testimony, and we can come to some, some uh, human conclusions, but we can never look on the heart. That's something that only God himself can do. And I've told my class over the years, I don't think it'll actually happen this way, but if it were, and we get to glory, we're suddenly going to realize that a lot of people are there that we didn't think would be, and there's going to be a lot of people not there that we thought should be. Now, it won't be that way because we're not going to have that kind of knowledge, I'm sure. But if, hypothetically, if that were the case, we would both be surprised and disappointed. Because, see, we can't look on the heart. We can look at somebody's outward veneer and we can come to a conclusion. But that's not the heart. And here's where we have to be so careful. This is why the scripture says also, judge not. You and I can't judge as to whether or not a person is a child of God. Only God knows. And so consequently, this baptism that Paul alludes to now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, For as the body, that is this human body, is one. In other words, from head to toe, we are controlled by one central nervous system, one mind, one brain. And so our whole body, even though it is operating throughout all the members, Paul says, hath many members, and all are members of that one body, being many, ten fingers if we're normal, and ten toes, and our eyes, and our ears, and all the various functions of this body are different, and yet they're one, see? All right, so also, he says, is Christ, and of course he's referring to the body of Christ. So also is the body of Christ. Now verse 13, this may shock some people, but again, I'm not changing the wording, I'm not twisting it, we're going to leave it set exactly where it sets. For by one Spirit, and that word Spirit is capitalized, so who is it in reference to? The Holy Spirit. For by one Holy Spirit are we, and remember Paul always writes to believers, What's the next word? All. See? Not just a favored few. Not just a special elite. But how many? All. All. But of course, that's according to God's determination of who is a believer and who is not. So, by the Holy Spirit then, are we all, every believer, whether weak or strong, whether spiritual or carnal, we are still all baptized into the one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, we've all been made to drink or partake of what? That one spirit. Now let me qualify. The body of Christ, which of course came on the scene in the New Testament sometime, I think, after Pentecost. Now, that's again where a lot of people will disagree with me, and that's fine. You go ahead and search the Scriptures until you're sure you can prove me wrong. But I am myself convinced that the body of Christ did not necessarily begin at Pentecost because Pentecost was strictly a Jewish holiday with a Jewish message. But when the gospel begins to go out to Jew and Gentile, especially up there at the church at Antioch, where in Acts chapter 11 it says, they at Antioch, when they became believers, were first called what? Christians. Christians. See? That's where they began to be called Christians. Not the Jewish believers at Jerusalem in those previous years, but when Gentiles started coming in by faith in the gospel of the grace of God, they were now called Christians, the scripture says. And so that's where I have to feel that the body of Christ began is when Paul begins to preach this message of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and by faith and faith alone without the law. And as men and women began to believe that, then the Holy Spirit baptized or placed them into the body of Christ. Now, I asked my class the other night, and I've asked all my classes over the years, I don't care what denomination you're a part of, it doesn't make any difference, the question is still valid. Is every member on your church roll a genuinely born-again Christian? No. Now, we can't judge. 
but we know for a fact that they are not all true believers. And so, what about the unbeliever? Are they members of the body of Christ? No. No, they can't be. They're unsaved. Only the saved go into the body of Christ. And so, this is where I get the premise, the only baptism that really counts for eternity is this one. The one that places the true, genuine believer into the body of Christ. Now you can have your name on umpteen church rolls, but unless you're in the body of Christ, you're doomed. The scripture makes it so plain. But if you are a child of God tonight, you are in the body of Christ by virtue of the placing it there by the Holy Spirit, as Paul makes it so plain here. And then, as members of the body, we all still maintain our individuality. We all have a unique place in that body, and yet we are all what? One. See? And that's why when you walk into a room full of fellow believers, are you a stranger very long? No. No. Oh, I've experienced it, and I know you have. And I know I've had people from far off states come into my class and on the way out they'll say, you know, the minute I stepped into this room I felt at home. Well, that's as it should be. Because you see, when you're with fellow believers, there's that oneness that any other group of people can never experience. All right, now then, I didn't, like I said, I didn't plan to go into that, but uh, for some reason we were led to it. But now back to Romans chapter 6. Beginning with verse 5, he said, For if we have been planted... See? Now the analogy is, of course, is planting a seed. If you were to plant a kernel of wheat, and all things being appropriate, what's the first thing that seed does? It dies. See? It germinates, yes. It dies. Now when that seed dies, what else happens? New life. Now the whole system of nature, and of course we've again alluded to this many times over the last couple of years in, in this teaching, the whole sphere of springtime is a picture of what? Death, burial, and resurrection. Everything that produces the seed in the fall, that seed falls someplace, but it's going to die. And when everything is right, it's going to spring up in the new life. It's going to reproduce again. Death, burial, and resurrection. All right, now it's the same way in the spirit. We have to die. You remember the very first law, if you want to call it that, that God gave to Adam and Eve concerning the tree? The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt what? Surely die. See? Surely die. There's no escaping it. Well, you see, Ezekiel comes along many years later and he puts it in a little different language, but it's still the same law. The soul that sinneth shall what? Surely die. So you see, the human race is faced with no alternative but that we have to die because we're born in sin. And yet there is a loophole. And what's the loophole? We can die in the person of Christ on the cross. By identification, by faith, by trust, that when he died, I died. When he died, you died. See? And that's what Paul is saying here. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, see? If we can honestly believe that he died my death, see? Then we shall also be in the likeness or with him when? In resurrection. Now see, that's, that's our blessed hope. And we aren't just going to live and die like a dog. And we don't have to live and die with the prospect of an eternal doom. We can live and die with the prospect that the best is yet to come, isn't it? What is the old, one of the old reformers said, and maybe it's even scripture, that the greatest thing that can happen to the believer is to what? Is to die. See? Now, we don't like to face death for a multitude of reasons. We don't like to leave our loved ones. We like to still be part and parcel of, of our energy and of our designs and so forth. But in reality, in reality, death for the saint is what? It's glorious. It's just on to something far better, see? But 
For those who have not experienced this identification, death is something indeed to be feared. Death is something horrible to experience because it's not going to something better, it's going to what? Something a thousand, a million times worse. All right, so now then verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man... Now, we haven't taught the book of Romans in this class. Someday we're going to get there. But when Paul speaks of the old man or the old nature, who's he talking about? The old Adam, see? The old Adam that we're born with. You remember last week when we talked in Ephesians chapter 2 that we who were dead in trespass and sins have now been made alive? Well, how were we dead in trespass and sin? In the old Adam that we're born with, see? So now come back to verse 6 that our old man, our old Adam is crucified with him. Now what does crucifixion do? It kills, see? And when we're crucified with Christ, what do we, or what does God do with the old Adam? He kills him. See, in so many words, he puts him out of commission. And so he goes on to say that the body of sin might be destroyed or put out of commission, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. You know, several years ago, I, I had some judges in my classes, and it was always interesting to bring up an analogy of this, that what if they had in their courtroom someone who was convicted of a hideous crime and all the evidence was against him and they're about ready to turn it over to the jury and uh, they're almost sure, you know, the jury's going to find him guilty. But just before it happens, the old boy dies. Well, then I always like to ask one of the judges, you know, I said, well, now what happens? It's all done. The case is ended. It's closed. You can't try a dead man. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? You can't do any kind of business with a dead person. Now, this is the analogy that Paul is driving. If our old Adam is dead, can you any longer deal with him? No. See? That's the whole idea. So that he that is dead, in other words, those of us who have let old Adam be crucified, we are now dead to the desires of that old Adam. And that's, the, again, the power of God. You don't work for something like that. You don't try to attain this. This is all part of the power of God when it's exercised in his saving salvation. And then verse 8, and then we're going to get back to Exodus for a moment or two. Now if we be dead with Christ, that is by identification with the crucifixion, we believe that we shall also, what? Live with him, see? And that's why the resurrection is fundamental to our faith. You know, I've had quite a few people, more than I like, tell me, well, I've had a Sunday school teacher, or I've had a preacher who, who could certainly preach about Christ and his earthly ministry, could preach about his crucifixion, but they had trouble with the resurrection. What about those people? Well, I'll tell you what about them. According to Scripture, if they can't believe all of it, they're as lost as if they believe none of it. We have to believe that Christ rose physically, literally, spiritually, every which way you can think of from the dead. And he's alive evermore. All right, now then let's go on to verse 10 and we'll go back to Exodus. For in that he died, he died unto sin. In other words, to rid us of old Adam. How many times? Once. See, once for all, the hymn writer has put it. The book of Hebrews, over and over, that this Christ did once, and it satisfies for all eternity. All right, now then, let's go quickly back to Genesis for the few moments we are, uh, Exodus for the few moments we have left. And uh, we find now that as the Egyptians are floating up on the seashore, and the Israelis look back at the view, and I don't want this to sound morbid, but what's the first three words in chapter 15? Then sang Moses and the children of Israel. Now this is the song of Moses. Now I'm not going to take time to, to read through it. Read it when you have some spare time. Because I, I think it's rather important. Because when you get to the book of Revelation and we get into the eternal state, what are we going to sing? The song of Moses, see, the song of redemption, that the battles are over.
and that we have now attained that to which God has been bringing us all along. So the Song of Moses, like I said, I'm not going to read it. You study it in your own spare time. All right, now verse 22. We'll move on just for a little bit yet. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. In other words, they've crossed it. The waters have come back, drowned the Egyptians, and now Moses begins to lead that multitude down toward Mount Sinai. And so he brings Israel out from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went out three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now that's a dilemma, isn't it? That many million people and all that livestock, and there they are in that hot Middle Eastern Sinai desert, and no water. Verse 23, And when they came to Merah, an oasis of some sort, they could not drink of the water of Merah, for they were bitter. In other words, undrinkable. Now, the first thing I like to point out to new believers, whether they're young or old, is that in just a little while after their salvation experience, they're going to run into a bitter experience. I mean, it's just the way God works. We are never saved to walk a rose-petaled pathway. We're going to have trials. We're going to have difficulties, just like Israel did. Israel comes now down into that forbidding desert, and God doesn't just give them a, a hunk of roses. They're going to go through some, some very trying times. And here was the first one, right off the bat. They're thirsty. Their cattle are bellering and their sheep are bleeding and no water. And then when they do find it, a bitter disappointment. It's not fit to drink. Now, let's read on. We don't want to stop there. And in verse 24, the people naturally murmured against Moses and they said, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a what? A tree. Now the article again I was reading concerning this referred to this. That Moses just found a branch out there in the desert and he threw it into the water and through some chemical reaction it became fit to drink. And you know, see they lose the whole thought. The tree throughout all of scripture points to only one tree and what is it? The cross. Now, I haven't got time what's left, but you see, there's a reason why the cross is referred to as a tree. It's because back in Deuteronomy, it says, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And so the cross was the place of curse. It was where God literally poured out his wrath upon our Passover lamb. So anyway, when they come to the place of a bitter experience, there's only one remedy. And what is it? The cross. See, this is what God wants us to do. Whether we've been a Christian for years on end or whether we're a new believer, when a trial or a tribulation comes, where do we go? To the foot of the cross. Because, see, that's where everything begins and ends for us today. If we try to bypass the cross, we're just hopeless as these Jews were in Egypt. But it has to be, again, let me repeat it, the work of the cross, see? And so he cast the tree into the waters, and as soon as the tree was cast, what happened? The waters were made sweet. And so also in our experience, if we can just learn that when tribulations and disappointments and sorrows come, my, we just race to the foot of the cross because that's where everything has been satisfied. All right, now then, after that bitter experience made sweet, Moses again leads them by virtue, of course, the cloud and the pillar of fire, which is the very presence of Jehovah who is leading them on. And he brings them now to an oasis. And again, here's one of those questions that I just can't answer, and I guess every class has asked it. Well, what's involved here in the 12 wells of water and the 70 palm trees? Well, I'm sure there's something involved, but all I can say is it was an oasis. <laughs> and it was just a place where they could have water to drink. Seven million people couldn't rest under the shade of 70 trees. But whatever, it epitomized a place of rest, relaxation, and the satisfaction of their thirst. And so they came to Elim, verse 27, where were 12 wells of water, 
and three score or 10 or 70 palm trees and they encamp there by the water. Now we'll just for the moment that's left go on into chapter 16, you know. Maybe I won't even have to go into chapter 16. I think I can finish the minute with just plain common sense. I think most believers are aware of the expression, a mountaintop experience, aren't you? What's a mountaintop experience? Oh, I mean something that just thrills you. But you know what? You don't accomplish anything on a mountaintop, do you? I mean, it's a beautiful place to see the view. It's a beautiful place to feel the exhilaration of that high altitude air. But where does the work have to be done? Down in the valley. And so it always is with a Christian experience. You may have a mountaintop experience, but listen, don't try to stay there. You've got to get down into the dirt and grime of the valley where you'll have the trials and the tribulations and the disappointments. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding, a weekly Bible study. Now, here is Les Felding. And again, it's good to have everybody here in the studio audience. And for those of you gathering with us in the television audience, we trust that you'll get your Bible, even as we do here. And while I'm making an announcement or two, you in the studio can be turning to Exodus chapter 16 so we can pick right up where we left off last week. But for those of you in the television audience, so many of you have written now over the last year or two whether we have any print material. And up until now, if I just simply courteously and kindly say no, because I'm just a layman, I haven't had time to ever put anything into print. But the Lord works, and He has now accomplished it through no effort of my own. Uh, shortly after we went on the Colorado station, a lady called and asked for print material, and I again had to answer the same way. I said, we just don't have any. And she said, well, do you have the VCR tapes of your programs? Yeah, we've got that. And so she voluntarily said, well, can I take it off the VCR and put it into print? She said, I've got the computers. She said, I've got the word processors. And she said, I think we can, we can make it work. And uh, lo and behold, uh, she put it into the computer. I critiqued it and hopefully corrected any errors. And now with the help of Nancy Carter here in Tulsa and the local printers, we can now offer all the lessons starting back in Genesis 1-1 in a booklet form. Now, of course, we're, we're just beginning. We're, we're amateurs at this, but we trust that as we go along, we'll be making improvements. But we're going to offer these little booklets. This one is, I think, the first three lessons. We're going to offer these to anyone who will write for it for... Well, I'm going to put $2 on it. Everybody tells me to charge more, but uh, if, if you can send us $2, that'll cover the cost of our printing and, and mailing because no one takes any money out of this ministry except the accountant who does our IRS work. This gal is doing it for nothing. You all know that I do everything I do for nothing, and even the people who take care of our business and pay the bills and deposit the checks, they all do it on a voluntary basis. So we like to feel that every dollar that comes into this ministry, 99 cents of it goes for production and television time. So if you'd like a copy of this, watch for our mailing address on the screen, and you write for it, and if you possibly can, can include $2 to cover the cost of it, and we'll appreciate that. Now, I hate to take time out of our short 30 minutes because most of our mail has only one complaint, and that is that 30 minutes isn't long enough. So we hate to use any of this for announcements, but once in a while we have to. Now, you know, several weeks ago we had an all-day seminar over at Tahlequah, and uh, one of the fellows used his VCR. Now, this is not a professional production. It's just simply a, uh, a personal VCR camcorder. But if you're interested, the uh, gentleman who made it and, again, the lady in Tulsa who is helping him with the dubbing are going to let us offer these to anyone who will write for one for a $10 contribution to the ministry. Again, no one's going to make any money on these. It's just a, a goodwill gesture as well as a means of getting the word out. Now, this is more or less an overview all the way from Genesis 1 and through a good part of Revelation. Now, remember, this is all done in one day, so it's not in detail, but uh, I think we fairly well covered some of the great themes in Scripture. Now, once in a while, the station people here think I should 
at least share some of our mail with you. And we just picked up a letter yesterday, and I'm just going to read you her closing statement because, again, this letter is so typical of, of what we're receiving from the television audience as well as those who are getting the VCRs. And she simply closes her letter. She says, I can't begin to tell you what your teachings have done for me. I have grown more in the last six months than I have the entire 46 years of my life, and thank you sincerely. Now, this letter comes from a wheat farming family up in Montana, right next to the Canadian border. And so we appreciate it. We don't do these things for compliment, but I'll tell you what, it sure helps to know that something is being accomplished for the Lord in what we are doing. All right, so much for that now. I've also put on the blackboard, for those of you here in eastern Oklahoma, so many people come to my class and they're exasperated to find out that we've been teaching in their area for a year, two years or more, and they didn't know it. So sometime during the program, just try to take a location that you're close to, whether it's uh, Tahlequah or Wilberton or Tulsa or McAllister, and take note of the times and the places where we meet. All right, so much for that. Now we've got to get into the book as quickly as we can. Turn with me now to Exodus chapter 16, and you remember that last week we left off with Israel at, well, in the English, it's Elim, E-L-I-M, up there in verse 27 of 15. In the Hebrew, I guess it's pronounced El Elam. But whatever, they now have to move on. You know, I think I, my closing remark was, you can't just stay on the mountaintop. All the hard work is down in the valley. And even though this was almost a mountaintop experience for the children of Israel, having come out of Egypt and come to this beautiful oasis, yet now they have to move on. They're going to keep moving on down through the Sinai now. And they're, in short order, going to be arriving at Mount Sinai itself. And they're going to receive, of course, the law. So in chapter 16, now verse 1, they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Zin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month. Now you want to remember, they left Egypt in April, and so now this is May. Now also remember that in that area of the world, in that part of the desert, it's getting hot, and they're going to be needing water. And now again, don't just picture a few little families or even a few hundred people or a few thousand. Remember, we've got a few million. And with all their livestock, it's going to take a tremendous amount of water just to satisfy their thirst. So anyway, uh, we come on down to verse 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, that is to Moses and Aaron of verse 2, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. See, they're already getting squeamish about where Moses is taking them. Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when he sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. Isn't it amazing how short memory can be? They didn't have it that good. They were slaves and they were under bondage and uh, they, they didn't have that much flesh to eat. I mean, it almost sounds like they dined in some steakhouse every night, doesn't it? And they didn't. But nevertheless, they, they're, they're getting squeamish of where Moses is taking them. And now they're wishing that he would have left them in Egypt, if only they knew. Then verse 4, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them or test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, we're not going to take the time because it's already taking so much longer, almost two years, just to get this far from Genesis through Exodus. So I'm going to have to start skimming some of these intervening chapters and the things that I'm sure you're all quite aware of. But anyway, we come down now, if you will, to verse 14, and we're going to have the appearance of the manna. And I think most of you who know anything about your Bible at all, you'll remember that Israel lived on manna for 40 years. Now, you know, they finally learned to cook it one way or another way and fix it various ways, like I think you gals get adept at doing, even with some leftovers. But they got to the place where they could fix manna just about any way you can think of in order to just be able to, to stomach that same food day in and day out. But nevertheless, uh, God provided. And the whole idea, of course, with manna, in order to grasp a 
practical application for us today is that this is the very bread of God. And you remember that Jesus in John's Gospel spoke of himself as the bread of life. I am the living bread. He's also the living water. But back here in, in its instigation, manna, of course, is going to sustain the house of Israel as they have come out of Egypt and all through their 40 years of wilderness journey. Now you also remember that in this account from verse 14 through verse 22, that before the law is given now, that won't happen until chapter 20, so before the law is given, God institutes a commandment that on the sixth day they shall gather how much manna? Well, a double portion, because he is going to institute the Sabbath even before he gives the law. Now, I think this is rather interesting in that back in the chapter 1 of Genesis, where we have the recreation, as I call it, God brought everything onto, onto the scene in six days, and then on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested. And so we have that setting up of the six days of labor and the one day of rest. Not one that God was all tired out at the end of that six days, but he was setting something up that would be for man's own good. And I think it carries on even into our own economy that God still knows what's best for us, and that is that we need one day out of the seven for rest. Now, if you'll look then in Exodus, where we are in chapter 16, as they have now been instructed to gather twice as much on the sixth day. Then in verse 23, he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow, that will be the seventh day now, remember, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and seethe, or cook or boil that which you will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up, verse 24, as Moses instructed, and it did not smell, neither was there any worm therein. <clears throat> and Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six days, verse 26, you shall gather, and so forth. Now, I've already mentioned now, this is instituted, this is set up before the Ten Commandments are given, where it mandated that they should have that Holy Sabbath on the seventh day. Now, there's a lot of confusion today about the Sabbath, isn't there? And I've instructed my classes over the last 20 years, don't ever call Sunday the Sabbath. Sunday is not a Sabbath. It's not the seventh day, it's the first day. Now we know that beginning back here, as God is dealing with Israel, he does set up the seventh day as the day of rest, the day of worship, and it's the holy day. And he will incorporate it, of course, into the Ten Commandments. But we always have to remember that the high point, and now turn back with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 20, the very epitome, the very high point, the very crescendo of all of God's dealing with man centers in not only his death, not only his burial, but what? His resurrection. And see, this is what sets us apart. We have become believers after his resurrection. And the message that Paul is given down there in, in Mount Sinai, again, as I've pointed out before, just as sure as God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai and Moses took it down to the people of Israel, I feel that God took Saul of Tarsus from Damascus down to Mount Sinai. He spent three, three years down there all by himself in a pri private personal seminary experience where the Lord revealed to him the doctrines of grace. And Paul doesn't stay on Mount Sinai, but he takes it down, even as Moses did to Israel. Paul takes it down and takes it out to the Gentile. Now, what separates all this, of course, is the resurrection. We are on resurrection ground. We're not back here on the legal ground of the Mosaic system. Now, if you got Acts chapter 20... And I know, like I said, it's a controversy with so many people and, and various groups that, oh, I know one group likes to shout from the housetops that America is having all of its problems because we have forgotten to keep the Sabbath.
Well, we've got problems, and a lot of it is spiritual, but it's not because we don't keep the Sabbath, because Paul never instructs us to keep the Sabbath. And instead, it's the first day of the week, because it was on the first day of the week that Christ rose from the dead. All right, now then in chapter 20, as Paul has now already, by virtue of several chapters of time, is out ministering amongst the Gentiles. And then you'll drop down in chapter 20 of Acts to verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi. And I remember Philippi was up in northern Greece. And so they sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven. And now look at verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples, now the disciples here doesn't refer to the twelve, it refers to these believers who had become believers by virtue of Paul's preaching the message of grace up there in northern Greece, beginning with Thessalonica and Colossae and Philippi. And so they came on the first day of the week to break bread, and Paul preached unto them. Now it's interesting that we also have the, the same connotation in uh, where is it? First Corinthians, First Corinthians, chapter sixteen. First Corinthians, chapter sixteen. And I'm touching on this because I, I have so many people. They'll either call or they'll ask me in class or something like that. Are you sure that we're not supposed to keep the seventh day Sabbath? Yes, I'm sure, because, you see, that was under the law. It was given even before the law, like I've said, but it was also incorporated into the law. And it's interesting that of all the Ten Commandments that Paul refers to throughout his letters, the only one he makes no mention of whatsoever is the one regarding the Sabbath. In other words, Paul will say that since the law is fulfilled with love, therefore we don't steal. Therefore, we don't commit adultery. Therefore, we do not bear false witness. And it follows naturally that we do not have idols and we do not make idols. And so Paul, in one way or another, and then in Ephesians, I almost forgot that one, in Ephesians he refers to the one considering honoring parents, where Paul makes mention that children ought to obey their parents because it's the first commandment with a promise. So Paul makes a reference to nine of the commandments, but the tenth one is glaringly absent, and that's the one concerning the Sabbath. That separates us from the legal system, you see. All right, but now in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, where again he's writing to the Gentiles there at Corinth, and he says, now concerning the collection or the offering for the saints. Now, you remember, Paul was instructed by Peter and James back there in Acts chapter 15. And, well, yeah, I guess we're going to have to agree that you can go to the Gentiles without making legalists of them, without Judaizing them. But be sure you remember the poor here in Jerusalem. And you remember why they were poor, don't you? You remember early in Acts when they had lands and houses, if they had CDs or whatever, what'd they do with them? They sold them and they put all their money into a common kitty and everybody lived on it. Remember that? Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, everybody had all things common. Well, I don't care. You can have the best of investments unless you've got an awful lot of it. If you just take a certain amount and put it into a common kitty and let everybody start living on it, hey, we found out about it here in America. Even with our tremendous amount of, of resources, yet our entitlement programs, what are they doing to us? Hey, they're breaking us, see? Because you just cannot, you cannot continue to just hand it out, hand it out, hand it out, until what? You run out. Well, that's exactly what happened to those believers at Jerusalem. They had sold everything, they'd put it into a common kitty, and they all lived. Everybody had all they needed. The scripture says no one lacked, but what happened? They ran out. And of course, had Israel accepted the kingdom, they wouldn't have needed it. They wouldn't have had to have houses and lands. Everything would have been uh, the utopia that everyone is still looking for. But Israel rejected the kingdom, the kingdom did not come in, and so what happened? 
Well, their kitty ran out and they became destitute, but God in his sovereignty continues to watch over them by laying it upon the hearts now of the Gentile believers of Paul's gospel that they would give offerings for the poor saints at Jerusalem. All right, now here's the background then for 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection of the offering for the saints, those Jerusalem believers, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week. See that? Now, a lot of people have, have even told me, well, Sunday was elevated as, as part of a pagan background. Well, I can't help that the pagans happen to name the first day of the week, maybe after the sun god or whatever the case may be. But our whole idea of the first day of the week is not necessarily the name of the day, but it was the day of the resurrection. See, and always remember that. That it was on the resurrection day, the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, not according to 10% of your income, although, that, again, that's the guideline. I don't want people to misinterpret me or misunderstand me. Beginning way back with Abraham in Genesis chapter 14, you remember when he had the spoil after defeating the kings that had overrun Sodom and he brought Lot back? How much of the spoil did Abraham give to Melchizedek? 10%. And so it is a guideline. I, I will never say anything other than that. But what I do maintain is that when you mandate that somebody gives 10% or else, you're putting them back under the law. And again, Paul never says that. But what does he say? Oh, when you give, give as the Lord has what? Prospered you. See, it's up to you. You're not under a mandate of law, but you are left now with your your own free conscience as it's led by the Holy Spirit to give as God has prospered you. So he says, there will be no offerings when I come. In other words, Paul, I guess, felt like I do. There's nothing I hate worse than to have to ask for money, and that's why we won't do it in this program. I, I, I just detest it. And I think Paul did too. And so he says, have all that done before I get there, because I don't want to have to ask for money. All right, now then, one more uh, scripture reference with regard to this day of the week. Turn with me back to Romans, if you will. Romans chapter 14, and here again, I'm not taking anything away from our Sunday services, but on the other hand, I always have to remember what the old evangelist, I think most of you still remember, old John R. Rice, and he used to almost deplore the Sunday morning worship hour. And of course, what he was deploring was the fact that it had just become a ritual. It was that one hour of the week when people thought that they were fulfilling their obligation to God. And listen, I like what Paul says here. Romans 14, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day. Now, if you've got a translation like a King James, the word is alike. But it's in italics, isn't it? Now, those of you who have been in my class for over years and years, you know what italics mean. It's been added by the translators to clarify. But I think it's clearer if it's left out. So now read that verse as it would be without the italics. Let uh, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day, period. You know what that means? Do you just become a Sunday Christian? Do you just become aware of worship and praise one day a week? What should we? All seven of them, see? Every day of the week to you and I in this age of grace who realize all that God has done on our behalf. I'm worthy of none of it. You're worthy of none of it then is it too much to expect that every day becomes a day of praise and worship? Now, that doesn't mean we have to go to a formal service. It doesn't mean you have to have your church door open seven days a week. But it does mean that your Christian walk should just not depend on a one-day-a-week service or worship. Every day, see? And, and that's perfectly in accord with what Paul said. But when it comes to the formal coming together of God's people, on what day does Paul refer to? the first day, see? Now, I hope that may have helped a little bit.
I had another thought I was going to share. I think this half hour is almost gone already. Never dawned on me until just the other day. How many of you haven't heard the expression, well, have you ever prayed the sinner's prayer? Could you sit down with somebody and help them pray the sinner's prayer, or the publican's prayer? What was the sinner's prayer? God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now think of me. I'm going to shock you. I'm going to shock a lot of people on television. Because the book shocks me almost every day. Do you realize that after all that Christ has done, it is a finished transaction? Do you realize we don't have to ask or beg for mercy? It's already been done. You ever thought of that? We are actually amiss to say to God, be merciful to me. He's already been merciful when he died, when he suffered, and when he was victorious and rose from the dead and now offers salvation. Not to someone who can crawl through all kinds of, of, of human suffering in order somehow to approach God. I mentioned it in one of my classes the other night. I can remember years ago hearing an elderly lady in our church talk about some poor lost individual. And she said, oh, I can still hear her. Oh, if only that poor man could pray through. Well, pray through what? What's he supposed to pray through to somehow approach God? There is nothing to pray through. It's all been done. And remember I said here a few weeks ago, where is the door to the sheepfold? It's ground level. It's not up in some unattainable place. It's not down in some deep cavern. It's not across some raging river. It's right in front of us. And so the same way, his mercy has already been accomplished. We don't have to beg for it. And the same thing, I think, comes into this area of forgiveness. Do you and I have to beg to be forgiven? No. You're already forgiven. You're in Romans, aren't you? Turn back with me to Colossians, because like I say, I'm not going to have time to go back to Exodus anyway. Col Colossians. Colossians, I think it's chapter 2. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. You know, so many of these things, we just don't think of them. We, we still have got that mentality of, of what the Scripture said before the cross, and we try to bring it in after the cross, and you have to remember, and I think I shared this in the class the other night, and the thought just come to my mind again. You've all heard the beautiful song, and the cross makes the what? The difference. It is a difference. It does make a difference. All right, Colossians chapter 2 down to verse 13, and you, Paul writes to us believers, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, in other words, we're still uh, dealing with that old Adam at that time, he hath, now what's that verb tense? Past tense, it's done. He hath quickened or made us alive with him having past tense, what's the next word? Forgiven. Isn't that great? He has already forgiven all our sins. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with And it's good to have everybody back with us and uh, we're going to have the studio audience turn once again to Exodus chapter 17. And for those of you joining with us on television, we announced last week and we'll announce now for the next few weeks at least that we finally are getting our lessons in Genesis in printed form. We've got the first two or three half hours put from the VCR into the print and uh, we're going to offer them to anybody who will write for them for a small stipend of two dollars which will at least cover our expenses. We aren't trying to make any money on any of these things. And then for those of you who realized we had an all-day seminar at Tahlequah a couple of weeks ago and uh, one of the gentlemen there made a VCR of it. Now, it's not intended to be professional, but uh, it is interesting, we think. And they have put it on tape, and they're reproducing them, and they're offering them for anyone who will ask for it for a $10 offering to the ministry. So there again, no one is going to make anything on it per se for themselves. And uh, that four hours covers everything from Genesis through Revelation in, a, in an overview, but uh, I think, again, uh, you'll be able to glean something from it. So, 
If you'd like either one of these, call us or write to us, and we'll try to get it to you as soon as possible. Now then, if you'll go back with me to Exodus chapter 17, we come out of chapter 16 where they have been given the manna, and as we mentioned last week, how that the Sabbath was instituted so that they would pick up twice as much on the sixth day, Friday, in order to have enough so that they wouldn't have to work on the seventh. Now we come into chapter 17, and remember that, if you can picture this in your mind, I was going to bring a, a professional map along, and I just plumb forgot. You know how that is. We're all human. But anyway, uh, if you can picture the, the Sinai Peninsula, and as the children of Israel now are making their way down that peninsula toward Mount Sinai, which most Bible scholars feel was down toward the southern end of the, of the peninsula. And on their way now, they have gotten hungry and murmured, and God gave them the manna. Now again, remembering the heat and the climate of that area of the world, now in the month of May, they run out of water and they're thirsty. Now pick that up in Exodus chapter 17. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. And uh, according to the command of the Lord, and they pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide, or began to argue with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide, or why argue you with me? Wherefore do you tempt or test the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and they murmured, and they said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Now that must have been quite a group of people for Moses to put up with. And in fact, at one point in time, he says, God, these aren't my people. <laughs> they're yours, but they're not mine. But nevertheless, he was very human, and uh, I can see where he got exasperated. All right, now verse 4. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They almost are ready to stone me. Now verse 5, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel, thy rod, wherewith you smote the river. Take it in thy hand, and go. And now verse 6, here's one of the, I think, one of the glorious verses in all of Scripture. Behold, Jehovah says, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Now Horeb and Mount Sinai, remember, are one and the same. And underline the word rock, if you don't mind marking your Bible. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb. Thou shalt smite or strike the rock, that is, with his rod, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. Now, of course, God was also aware of the fact that there weren't only several million people, but what else? All their livestock. And so all this water, I, th I think you have a veritable river that just flows down through that desert floor. And they all had plenty to drink. Now, we have to identify the term rock. And again, I'd like to have you come back to the New Testament. Come up to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And always remember that all through Scripture, whenever the word rock is used in any kind of a symbolic setting, it only refers to one person, and who is it? Jesus the Christ. He is always the rock, or in another place, he's called the stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. So whenever there is a symbolic use of that term rock or stone, now here it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We might as well start with verse 1 to pick up what I call the flow. Moreover, brethren, Paul writes to the Gentiles again at Corinth, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, that is, you know, the, the cloud that symbolized the very presence of Jehovah by day and that fire by night. They were uh, baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual food, that is the manna that we covered last week. And they did all drink the same spiritual drink, that is the water that came out of that rock after Moses struck it. For they drank of that spiritual rock. Now the word rock is capitalized significantly because this rock goes on now the rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Christ. 
And so always remember it. In fact, let me take you back even to Matthew. And it's a verse that is, I think, been twisted all out of context in order to make it say something that it doesn't. Again, simply because people do not maintain a biblical rule of order. And that is that when a word is used in a particular way, it is never used out of that context. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew 16, the portion that most of you are well acquainted with, I use it so often to point out Peter's confession, what was his mode of salvation, and that, of course, was up in verse 16, where he comes to the conclusion, Thou art the Christ, Matthew 16, now verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, period. And then verse 17, Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father which also is in heaven. And again, that's that same intimation, that we cannot comprehend spiritual truths unless God opens our understanding. That, that's just part and parcel of it. Now, that doesn't take away our free will. That doesn't make us bound to a, a decision by God that we're going to go to hell or we're going to go to heaven. But nevertheless, before we can comprehend spiritual truths, God has to open our understanding, even as Jesus said, God did with Peter. Flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And then verse 18. This is the verse I want you to see. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter... And upon this rock. Now, there is the perfect example of using the term symbolically. Who is the rock? Peter or Christ? Well, Christ is all the way through Scripture. Then how can it break and suddenly make Peter the rock? Well, it doesn't. The rock referred to here upon which he will, future tense, build his church, is the rock the only rock of Scripture, and that is Christ himself. Now then, if you'll come back to Exodus chapter 17, where this rock has been smitten. Now there's a, a, a great lesson in that as well. For you and I, again, on this side of the work of the cross, and when I use the term work of the cross, remember I'm always talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. Why or how do you and I appropriate that finished work? Well, by faith, isn't it? It's by faith that we appropriate which has, that which has been done on our behalf. But in order for us to appropriate these things by faith, what had to happen to Christ first? He had to suffer. He had to die. He was, according to the Old Testament term then, he was what? He was smitten. See? He was smitten for our offenses. Now, keep that word in your mind because down the road a ways, when we get into the book of Numbers, and you're all aware of the account where again the children of Israel are murmuring and complaining that they haven't got water, and Moses has about come to the end of his patience. And you remember, he takes his rod, and contrary to God's instruction, instead of speaking to it, he does what? He strikes it, and you don't smite Christ twice. He has been smitten, and the word in Hebrew over and over is once. And this he did once. He went to the cross once. He does not go again and again and again. And so we always have to remember some of these basic truths of Scripture that he was smitten for our offenses, but only once. And now after his having been smitten and he has arisen from the dead victorious over sin and death, now we don't appropriate anything more by another crucifixion, but now we appropriate it how? Fellowship, speaking, see? Communication. That's why God has given us the whole uh, power of prayer that we can now speak with Him. We, we can praise Him. We can petition and all these things. Not through another smiting, but by speaking to Him. All right, now if you'll come back with me then to Exodus chapter 17. And so He smites the rock. Out comes all this water. And now you come down to verse 8. Then came 
Amalek. Now you've all heard about the Amalekites all the way back to your Sunday school days. And who were the Amalekites? Well, Amalek, of course, was a grandson of Esau, who was the one that had all his problems with Jacob. And so the Amalekites became the, the continuous enemy of the nation of Israel. Why do you suppose Amalek or the Amalekites begin to do battle with the Israelites at this point in time? Now we know that they have, like I said, they've been a burr under their saddle for all through their history. But why at this particular time do you think the Amalekites come up to do battle with Israel? Well, remember the setting. They're out there in a desert. There's precious little water and it is a tremendous commodity. And what do the Amalekites see? Oh, they see this abundance of water that has just been flowing out as a result of Israel's uh, having smitten the rock, see? And so now it becomes a, a warfare over the water that God has provided. And then you bring this into your own everyday experience. See, now many of these things, like Paul says, are written for our learning, not for our doctrine so much, but for our learning, just practical experience. Just as soon as a person comes into that right relationship with God, we become what we call born again, or we become a child of God, and we partake of that living water. What does the old flesh do? Hey, it begins to war, see? And the flesh wars against that new nature. And the Amalekites are a picture of that, I think. They're a picture now of the flesh warring against the spiritual. And so... Back here, of course, we're not in grace. We're still uh, in God dealing with the nation of Israel, and shortly we'll be in the law. But back here, they could fight physical battles and so forth, even though God comes in and helps them. But you see, now when we get into our economy, how do we fight our battles? Spiritually, see? We don't fight them with, with guns and swords. We fight them in the realm of the Spirit. All right, now, if you will, read on with me, beginning with verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did. This for a memorial in a book. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of Jehovah Nissi. Now, I'm just thinking of a verse. And I'm going to have you come back with me, if you will. I think it's in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 14. And the reason the verse just came to mind, I think somebody asked me about it, perhaps at that Saturday seminar when we were talking somewhat about the book of Revelation and the battle of Armageddon somehow. And uh, I think we use these verses in Zechariah chapter 14. And that's why I'm having you look at it a minute now. In Zechariah 14, let's again begin with verse 1. You all got it? Zechariah 14, verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Now this is prophecy, remember. This is the very battle that the book of Revelation talks about, the battle of Armageddon, when Christ returns. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided on America. How much of our 